bit, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. A very good afternoon to you all out there. It's 3 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Dorby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. We've got a corking show for you today, kicking off with an exclusive interview with Suella Braverman. She told GB News that the Chancellor of the Exchequer needs to slash income tax in tomorrow's budget and stand by to hear what she has to say about Lee Anderson and a load of other stuff. It's an absolute corker from Chris Hope. Next, no matter what Jeremy Hunt announces in tomorrow's budget, after a poll put the Tories on a record low of just 20%. I'll ask if Hunt can do anything to turn things around. Perhaps Swella Bravman could be the comeback queen. Next, GB News can reveal the police will ignore Rishi Sunak and will not change their approach for this week's huge pro-Palestine protest. And guess what? Sadiq Khan has waded in. And after all the rumours and speculation about the Princess of Wales, I'll bring you a big update on when she's going to return to royal and public duty. We've got a cracker coming up, and that's all coming in between now and six o'clock. Honestly, people, I'm so excited about today's show. I'm, I'm, I'm having to sort of keep myself calm. The Suella Bradman interview is absolutely magnificent. So many lines to pick apart, so many things to analyse, so many talking points, so much to go through. Get in touch, email me, gbviews at gbnews.com. Do you think Suella could save the Conservatives or is it too late for that? Please get in touch. But before all of that, it's time for your latest news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Martin, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Your top stories from the GB newsroom. Jeremy Hunt looks set to unveil a two-pence cut to national insurance as he prepares to set out Britain's budget tomorrow. The Chancellor will attempt to put the UK's economy back on track and revive Rishi Sunak's polling, despite the fiscal watchdog giving the government little headroom for tax cuts. But analysts suggest the NHS could be facing real-term funding cuts of £2 billion amid rising costs and a promise to tackle waiting lists. Liberal Democrats' leader Sarah Davies says the rising cost of living ought to be the priority. The truth is the Conservatives increased uh, taxes. Any tax cuts will really be a deception and a swindle on the British people because the vast majority of people are paying much higher taxes thanks to the Conservatives. Well, what Liberal Democrats want to see in the budget tomorrow is uh, an end to the cuts in the NHS. We're about to see the worst cuts in the NHS since the 1970s. And the choice uh, at the next election is going to be a Conservative chance a Conservative government who want to cut our NHS, or Liberal Democrats, Liberal Democrat candidates who want to make sure we protect our NHS. That's our top priority. Business Minister Greg Hans told GB News the government is being responsible. The government intervened well and correctly over recent years, for example, during the pandemic in terms of the supporting people to remain in employment, uh, the fact the government paid a big part of people's energy bills over the last couple of winters. I think people support that. Um, that is uh, why there's been an increase in public spending. Uh, but, as I said earlier, the economy is now turning a corner and that then sets us up nicely to be able to afford things like tax cuts. 
Suella Bravman has told GB News that she doesn't believe former Tory MP Lee Anderson is Islamophobic. Today's exclusive interview with the former Home Secretary comes after Mr Anderson claimed Islamists had got control of the London Mayor. Lee Anderson is a, a great colleague of mine. I I'm totally abhor the accusations that have been launched against him. He is not racist. He is not Islamophobic. He's calling out very poor performance by the mayor of London, who has completely failed to hold the Met Commissioner to account, and which is why we've seen emboldened Islamism in the streets of London. We've seen an MP hounded out of office because of Islamism. We've seen Parliament uh, totally subverted and the proper procedures abused uh, out of fear. That is, a GB News can reveal that the policing of a pro-Palestinian protest in London this week weekend will remain unchanged despite the Prime Minister's call for a crackdown on extremists. Officers will reportedly use existing public order and anti-terror laws without a change in their approach on the streets. In a rare speech outside Downing Street last week, Rishi Sunak called on police to draw a line and clamp down on extremist behaviour. That is, the Rwanda bill suffered another series of defeats in the House of Lords last night, in many cases by unusually large margins of more than 100 votes. Peers backed five changes to the government's flagship immigration bill, including an assurance that the safety of Rwanda can be challenged in the courts. Nearly 50 amendments were put forward, and the scale of the defeat raises the chances of a drawn-out tussle between the Lords and the House of Commons. An agreement on a revised offer for consultants, doctors in England has been reached in a potential step towards solving the ongoing dispute. Unions will now recommend the offer to their members ahead of an expected vote. The Health Secretary says it paves the way for an end to the strikes, while the Prime Minister said it's proof that seeking a fair agreement is the best way forward. A separate dispute involving junior doctors is still ongoing. And finally, remember this? It became the world's most watched television series throughout the 1990s and now those red bathing suits and slow motion jogs along the Californian beach are set to return. A new series has been commissioned by US network Fox. It'll see a whole new generation of lifeguards embarking on daring ocean rescues. The original series ran for a decade from 1989 until 1999 and made superstars of cast members including David Hasselhoff and Pamela Anderson. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or you can go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now back to Martin. Thank you, Tatiana. Now we've got so much to get through this hour, but of course there's only one place to start. And it's our exclusive interview with the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, ahead of the final spring budget before the general election. And with the Tories an incredible 27 points behind Labour in the latest polls, she's called on chance of the exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, to cut 2p off the basic rate of income tax tomorrow. Well, Swilla Bravman was speaking to our political editor, Christopher Hope, and he joins me in the studio now. Chris, an astonishing interview um, on a variety of topics, and it's fair to say she did not hold back at all. In fact, to me, it appears like a naked bid for the Tory leadership. She would deny that. Now, of course. She's simply doing an, an intervention after or being sacked as Home Secretary last November on taxation. Tomorrow is the budget. And that was the main thing she wanted to talk about, the 2p off income tax, she said, and to lift those, those income tax thresholds that have seen, in her words, doctors, <coughs> nurses and teachers drawn into paying it. Let's hear it. Have a, listen, listen to what she had to say. Well, I should say, first of all, I think we need to take a pragmatic and responsible approach to tax yes. cuts. We need to put the British taxpayer first because we're living through a 70-year high when it comes to the tax burden. But we also need to be able to afford those tax cuts. And we can't make uncosted promises. Labour makes uncosted and unfunded promises. And we are not them. We take a prudent approach. The Tories did once, of course, under Liz Truss. Well, I want to ensure that our public services are safeguarded because, at the end of the day, I want tax cuts. But no tax cut, however radical, will make up for the experience of people not being able to see a GP or a dentist or getting a police officer to attend a burglary. So we do need to take a responsible approach to our public service delivery and value for money 
for the British taxpayer. So that's the overall approach I would take. Yes, that, that's, the, that's the, 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 the mood music. But what taxes would you cut if you could? We hear uh, maybe 2%, 2p 2 off national insurance, for example. Is that enough? Well, I, I think personal taxes are a good place to start. They, given that 70-year high, and it sends a message to the British uh, taxpayer that we're on your side and your work will pay. My preference would be 2p off the basic rate of income tax. And you know, Rishi Sunak himself promised yeah. to take a penny off the basic rate. Yeah. I would go further with 2p because I think that would really uh, send the message that people will be able to keep more of what they earn. I think it also needs to be accompanied with a rising of the personal allowance, uh, the personal allowance and tax income thresholds because we've got the invidious situation now that our tax system actually disincentivizes work. It disincentivizes people from taking that promotion or working extra hours. And we've got millions of low and middle earners, particularly middle earners, mm. nurses and teachers who are being dragged into paying higher levels of tax in a way that was never intended. Now, Chris, a two pence tax cut, of course, that's what want people want to hear. But that's an easy thing to say when you're effectively within the Conservative Party, but in a sense, a bit like the opposition. She's mm. writing checks that she will never have to cash. And she's saying it on our channel because the right was basically expunged from the top of the team around Rishi Sunak in that reshuffle last November. So the, the right look at they look at the top of the government and say, well, where's the Suella? Where's that person in the cabinet calling for tax cuts? How to pay for it? Interesting. She talks about um, increasing taxes for companies that, that rely on foreign labour, not British -like workers. And that is an astonishing law. Well, that's a big one. So that would be increasing the skills and health surcharge. <clears throat> she said she tried to do that as Home Secretary, but, the, but it was blocked and they increased visa fees instead, but she says that's an inner, inelastic way to help that. She thinks other ways to do it might be cutting grants to railways. Difficult to deliver that one politically in the week when uh, train fares have gone up by so much for so many people and, dealing, and cutting the £20 billion pounds spent on carbon capture. She also turned to the issue of Lee Anderson, of course, mm. uh, who on this channel um, 10 days ago now, I think, talked about the weather, um, whether indeed uh, the city can't have been captured by uh, Islamists in his language, denied by the mayor. Here's where he had to say. Anderson is uh, a great colleague of mine. I think I'm totally abhor the accusations that have been launched against him. He is not racist. He is not Islamophobic. He's calling out very poor performance by the mayor of London, who has completely failed to hold the Met Commissioner to account, and which is why we've seen emboldened Islamism in the streets of London. We've seen an MP hounded out of office because of Islamism. We've seen Parliament uh, totally subverted and the proper procedures abused uh, because out of fear. Uh, 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 from Islamism. Uh, we've seen anti-Semitism at record highs. You know, I could go on. Of course, but the remark is not Islamophobic and there's no problem like that, that's of that nature in a party. I don't think Lee Anderson is Islam Islamophobic, not at all. So this feels, Chris, like a repositioning of Suella as the natural leader of the Conservative right and by that, by that recognition, you welcome Lee Anderson back in. Yeah, unusual here, but talk, talking there about, about tax and tax and spend. We know she, her views, don't we, on, on small boats and Rwanda and, and uh, home affairs issues. Yeah, and she talked there. She, I asked her also about the speech given by the PM in Downing Street mm. last Friday. I was in the street reporting for you, wasn't I, on your yeah. programme? And, and she, he, she said, great words, but where's the action? And yeah. she said there should be an emergency, emergency law to empower ministers to, to, to ensure that parts of London were not no-go areas for Jewish people. Mm. So she's being very tough in, on language on that too. And there's loads and loads to go through in the four o'clock and the five o'clock. There's more on our website and, the, and the, the interview is in full on YouTube. And astonishing stuff about emergency laws, anti-Semitism, Lee Anderson, the list goes on on Chris. Another cracking exclusive. Well done. Now let's get an alternative take on what Swella Braverman said and I'm joined now by former Labour MP Bill Rammel. Bill, welcome to the show. I don't know how much of that much. you overheard, but 2p off income tax, that's obviously going to be popular, but increasing taxation on foreign workers, Bill. Bit of a schism there, bit of a difference of position. What's your take on that? Well, I almost fell off my chair when I heard Suella Braverman talking about economic prudence. You know, she was a member of uh, Liz Truss's government when they drove the economy off the cliff and we're still all paying for the costs of that. She also talked about safeguarding public services. Well, even before the budget tomorrow and any further cuts that Jeremy Hunt announces, for the next few years, baked into the forward projections are cuts in non-protected -protect areas like local government, like housing, like social care, like transport, 
cuts of 17%. So how in any way, shape or form she can talk about safeguarding public services, I don't know. And the reality is we've got a feeble and a stumbling economy with no growth compared to an average of 2% under the last Labour government. And without growth, we are struggling. And I'm not sure we can afford uh, tax cuts. But, you know, even if tax cuts are delivered, we're still going to have the highest tax burden under this Conservative government since the Second World War. And what this government does is it gives with one hand and takes away with the other, because the underlying issue on taxation is that the thresholds on all tax rates are frozen until 2028. And I actually think it's politically dangerous for the Tory party to be heralding tax cuts. And yet after the tax cuts happen, people get their monthly pay slip and they find out they're still worse off. Well, but Bill, Bill Rammel, Chris Hope here, she says she, she talked about, of course, the prospect of a Labour government with the Tory party so behind in the polls. Uh, what would Labour do to control net migration? That's, a num that's an idea of putting a number on net migration, maybe tens of thousands, which Shreda Braveman has done in the past, but we haven't heard the same, have we, from Labour? Well, I think we have. And, and one, don't judge politicians on what they say judge them on what they do. We've got 745,000 net migration now. That's three times as high as it was when Labour left that office. And why? Because when we were in power, we focused on tackling the asylum backlog. I was part of that as a minister, and we dramatically reduced numbers. And unprocessed asylum claims are one of the biggest pull factors attracting, attracting migrants uh, to the UK. Secondly, you've got to tackle the skills deficit and you've got to ensure that we get people off benefits and into work to take some of the jobs that migrants are currently undertaking. But you do that uh, with, with support and you've got to cooperate with other European nations on illegal migration to get better returns agreements. <laughs> Yeah, but Bill, that means that means a deal with the EU, which would mean taking some have said up to 100,000 from the European Union. So a deal with the EU, a deal with Brussels means you won't get a free lunch. They're going to expect us to take a fair tranche there. And the net result will be increased migration to Britain under Labour if you follow that route. Well, no, we've not said that we will uh, entail an agreement that entails 100,000 extra migrants coming to the UK. But, you know, when we were part of the European Union, we didn't have a boats crisis because we had effective returns agreements. Now, I think with a Labour government with a different attitude towards the EU, we will negotiate and get better returns and better agreements and it's got to be better than the crisis we've got at the moment where we just stand apart from the european union we throw stones and they put their hands up and say well we're not going to work with you and we're not going to support you at all and we end up with the kind of crisis that we're facing at the moment and, the, and, the, and bill yes i mean we, I, I was struck by the language on on the issue there of net migration it echoes there of british jobs for british workers from gordon brown back in the day i wonder if you thought there was an element of that well look i i think seven hundred and forty five thousand net migration is far too high and is unsustainable <clears throat> and what we've got to do is one cut off the supply of uh of illegal migrants but then in terms of legal migration mm. and you know there are areas of our economy so you go into a, a a residential care home the places couldn't survive without uh without foreign labor but what we've got to do is equip and train british people to take on those jobs now that's going to be a challenge but we did it when we were in government last time and we can do it again OK, thank you very much for joining us. Former Labour MP Bill Rammel and, of course, Chris Hope, political editor. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again in the next hour. Now, we'll have lots more from Suella Bradman throughout the show, of course, and there's plenty of coverage of our exclusive interview with the former Home Secretary on our website, gbnews.com, and you've helped to make it the fastest-growing national news website in the country, so thank you very much. Now it's now time for the latest Great British Giveaway and your chance to win 12,345 quid, one, two, three, four, five, in cash and a whole host of seasonal treats. And here's how you get your hands on all that loot.
We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won, plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Grace of gets stuck in. Now, a new opinion poll has seen the Conservatives on a meagre 20%. And the big question is, can Jeremy Hunt pull any rabbits out of the hat in tomorrow's budget to boost the Tories' election chances, or is it simply too late? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. I'm Jacob rees and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Sir Jacob rees State of the Nation, Monday to Thursday from 8pm. You're now in exile. I imagine it wouldn't be safe for you to go back to Russia. Can I ask you if you feel safe personally... Uh, and what do you think can be done to remove Putin, or is he going to be there for as long as he wants? Uh, I think that's, that is, of course, fundamental question. It is, uh, there should be pressure inside Russia and outside. Inside Russia right now, it's impossible because Putin put all leaders in jail and some of us just abroad, you know, just two were already killed. Mr. Nemtsov, Boris Nemtsov, my friend, my collaborator on my party, was, was killed on the walls on Kremlin. Alexei Navalny was killed in jail and in the camp. And that is the, the people live in fear and the fear to identify themselves as the protesters, to identify themselves as against Putin's regime, etc. That's why today there is no no chance for opposition to raise in, inside Russia. But outside, of course, this war against Ukraine, that is the fundamental issue for all foreign leaders. And in fact, just support of Ukraine and to not to let Putin to, to, to destroy Ukraine, to defeat, destroy, uh, to defeat uh, uh, Ukraine, that is an important issue. Because just Ukraine, that's not just in Ukraine, war in Ukraine. Ukraine just fighting for their territorial integrity, but fighting for the whole European countries. Because after Ukraine, other countries could appear. Other uh, subject of uh, aggression could be. And Putin easily could try to test Article 5 of NATO, NATO Charter. It, could, it could, be, could be one of the small countries of uh, Baltic states. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel.
Welcome back. It's 3.23. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, after all the rumours and speculation, I've got big news about the Princess of Wales a little later in the show, and it's looking very positive. Before that, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt could squeeze public spending further in a bid to fund any tax cuts in tomorrow's spring budget. But public service workers say prioritising politically driven tax cuts over improving public services is completely wrong. Well, joining now to go over this is GB News' economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Liam, you're the man with a plan. It's tax cuts or die, surely. Can the Chancellor of the Exchequer pull a rabbit out of the hat? It's pretty clear, Martin, there is now going to be a tax cut of sorts tomorrow. It's not going to be a cut in the headline rate of income tax. It's going to be a cut, another cut, in the headline rate of national insurance, precisely as you and I were discussing on your show yesterday. Now, back in January, the Chancellor cut the headline rate of national insurance from 12p in the pound to 10p in the pound, and I think tomorrow he's going to announce that's going down to 8p in the pound. The, those combined cuts will give the average worker around a £900 boost in their annual take-home pay. The first cut came in from January. I think the second cut will come in from July. Uh, it's cheaper, as we get discussed yesterday again, to do a cut in the headline rate of national insurance rather than the headline rate of income tax because pensioners pay income tax, landlords pay income tax on the rent that they receive. And so if you do a cut in the headline rate of national insurance rather than income tax, workers benefit from the national insurance cut, but pensioners and landlords don't, so it's cheaper. I think the other thing that's worth saying about the headline rate of national insurance is that national insurance applies in Scotland, whereas income tax, that's controlled north of the border by the Scottish Government. So this will apply to all workers in the UK across the board, which is what the Tories want, particularly north of the border, where they're trying to limit Labour's electoral gains north of the border. Labour are going to do well in Scotland, it seems. They only have two MPs north of the border, that's going to go up quite a lot if you believe the opinion polls. You mentioned public spending also, Martin. I don't think we're going to hear too much about public spending tomorrow because budgets are generally more about tax revenues rather than spending. There could be some spending announcements, but they're more likely to happen in the autumn statement or another comprehensive spending review. It's worth saying, though, that... There are 7.6 million people still on NHS waiting mm. lists for elective treatments. That is a near record. Uh, in 2025, the NHS, uh, the money it gets from the government, if you add in inflation, is likely to fall in real terms. That's what the Institute for Fiscal Studies say. So there'll be an increase in money for the NHS, but if you add in inflation, it will be what we call a real terms fall of just over 1%, and that could be the biggest drop in NHS spending, or one of the biggest drops annually since the 1970s. And beyond the NHS, it's also worth saying, as we've been hearing here on GB News, there are quite a few English councils, local authorities in England, that are looking down the barrel of a pretty bad situation. Four in ten English councils are at risk of going bust over the next five years. That's according to the respective accountancy firm Grant Thornton. So Jeremy Hunt is likely to talk about that tomorrow as well. Local government finance. We've seen Birmingham uh, announce it's got a Section 114 notice. It's saying it can't meet all its requirements. Uh, and that's the biggest council in Europe, obviously Britain's second city. So the public finances are tight, Martin. Everybody can feel that. But Jeremy Hunt is trying to get loads of little measures, raising taxes, you know, hitting the rich more duty on business class airfares, making the non-DOM tax status that lots of wealthy foreigners living in the UK make use of a bit less generous, perhaps a few other wheezes here and there to raise taxes, so he can carve out the room for manoeuvre to do that headline tax cut. It's not a headline income tax cut. That would have been too expensive. It's a headline cut in national insurance. But if you add together, Martin... The cut in national insurance we saw in January and the cut in national insurance, which I'm now saying will happen from April, the average worker in the UK will be about 900 quid a year better off, which is not to be sniffed at. 
OK, Liam, we've had a sneak peek there what the chance of the Exchequer might do. I think you'd make a blooming good Exchequer, <laughs> chance of the Exchequer. What would you do, Liam, uh, to, to capture the imagination of a wailing interest from the public who feel, oh, come on, give me something exciting. What would you do, Liam? Well, what I would do if I was Chancellor, I, I think that ship has sailed. Various people have said <laughs> I should be Governor of the Bank of England as well. Fat chance. Um, what I would do, precisely as I wrote in my Sunday Telegraph column uh, at the weekend, is I would raise what they call the personal allowance. Now, mm. yeah, no one pays income tax unless they earn above about twelve and a half grand a year. The average wage in this country is about 30-odd grand. So 12 and a half grand a year is a, a, is a low wage. It's often a part-time wage or so on. But, you know, many people do important jobs earn 12, 15 grand a year and fair, 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 fair play to them. But you don't pay tax until you reach 12 and a half grand a year. And then from 12 and a half grand a year, you pay the basic rate of income tax up to about 50 grand. That's at 20%. And then you pay... 40% above 50-odd grand, and then you pay 45% above 125-odd grand. What I would do, Martin, is I would raise that personal allowance that you don't pay any tax up until, I'd say, £20,000. Why would I do that? Because that will take a lot of people out of income tax, and because a lot of people earn in between 12 and a half and 20 grand, they pay income tax, but then they get it back in in-work benefits. It's all really, really complicated. They, they miss out. They, 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 sometimes when they earn more money, they actually end up paying a lot more tax. It, they keep very little of the extra money that they earn, so it discourages people from pushing themselves to work more, work harder, get better jobs and so on. It's a disincentive. So what I would do to make the system a lot fairer, to really regenerate uh, work, to tackle this real epidemic we've got in the UK of, of sort of people of working age not working, to encourage people to come back to work and to keep it simple, to make fewer civil servants paying benefits much, much more straightforward and cost effective. Raise the personal allowance from 12 and a half grand to 20 grand. Plain, simple, everyone can understand it. That's what I do. Now, in the short term, that may cost the state some money. And a lot of civil servants in Whitehall sucking their pencils and furrowing their brows, they would say, oh, it's far too radical, we can't possibly do that. I would do it. I think it would absolutely reinvigorate the British economy. I think it would indicate that we are an enterprise economy, we reward work, we reward people who get up in the morning and contribute to the economy. And we have got a problem of working-age, workless people in the UK now. We need to tackle that, we need to solve it. So, in my view... Radical measures are needed. And that, Martin, is probably why I'm not the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Getting Britain working again gets my vote. Liam Halligan, always on the money. Thank you, my friend. Superb stuff. Now, it's less than 24 hours to go until that budget, and we'll be doing two special shows live from Whitehaven tomorrow. And you can be part of the audiences for both Jubes & Co and The Nigel Farage Show. To get your tickets, go to gbnews.com. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and four o'clock, including today is Super Tuesday in the United States. Will it be the day when Donald Trump finally confirms that he'll be the Republican candidate for November's sensational presidential election? But first, it's time for those latest news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Martin, thank you. Your top stories from the GB newsroom. Jeremy Hunt looks set to unveil a two-pence cut to national insurance. That says he prepares to set out Britain's budget tomorrow. The Chancellor will attempt to put the UK's economy back on track and revive Rishi Sunak's polling, despite the fiscal watchdog giving the government little headroom for tax cuts. But analysts suggest the NHS could be facing real-term funding cuts of £2 billion amid rising costs and a promise to tackle waiting lists. Liberal Democrats leader Sir Ed Davey says the rising cost of living ought to be the priority. The truth is the Conservatives increased uh, taxes. Any tax cuts will really be a deception and a swindle on the British people because the vast majority of people are paying much higher taxes thanks to the Conservatives. Well, what Liberal Democrats want to see in the budget tomorrow is uh, an end to the cuts in the NHS. We're about to see the worst cuts in the NHS since the 1970s. And the choice uh, at the next election is going to be a Conservative chance a Conservative government who want to cut our NHS or Liberal Democrats, Liberal Democrat candidates we want to make sure we protect our NHS. That's our top priority. 
Police have named a 10-year-old girl who was found dead in the West Midlands. The body of Shay Kang was discovered with injuries at an address in Sandwell yesterday afternoon. She was confirmed dead at the scene. A 33-year-old woman, understood to be known to the girl, has been arrested and taken into custody. GB News can reveal that the policing of a pro-Palestinian protest in London this weekend will remain unchanged, despite the Prime Minister's call for a crackdown on extremists. Officers will reportedly use existing public order and anti-terror laws without a change in their approach on the streets. In a rare speech outside Downing Street last week, Rishi Sunak called on police to draw a line and clamp down on extremist behaviour. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2729 and €1.1710. The price of gold is £1,677.38 per ounce and the FTSE 100 is at 7,642 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Tatiana. Now, GB News can reveal that the police won't change their approach at this week's pro-Palestine protests, despite pleas from Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on Friday. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Yeah, so describe, hey. the con describe the contents of the letter for us, because it is quite strongly worded, isn't it? And it suggests that your property is empty. And what do they suggest yeah. is, it's going to be used for? They, they say, as part of this process, North Northamptonshire Council is identifying empty properties and sites within the area with the aim of encouraging owners to bring premises back into use or to find alternative options for derelict sites. The resettlement team in North Northamptonshire Council supports asylum seekers and refugees across three different projects, Homes for Ukraine, Afghan resettlement and asylum dispersal. At present, we are seeing a considerable increase in positive immigration decisions being made in favour of asylum seekers. So basically, they, they're wanting accommodation. But who goes around and assesses whether these properties are lived in or they are actually empty? Clearly, Ted, no, no one had bothered to come and look at your house uh, at all, had they? What do you want now? Because clearly you are both very shaken by this letter uh, and that, that letter that you received in response has not gone far enough. Do you want an apology? What, what more do you want to see? Well, she said here that she's, you know, I sincerely apologise, this Lindsay Bell Chambers. But I don't see... There was no explanation as to how they've come to say this property was empty, whether it was disused, whether it was unkempt... Or what? If you go back through the history of the property, it's it's not been empty. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my new show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm, where real people get to meet those in power and hold them to account. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country in the real world. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back. It's 3.38. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later in the show, we'll cross live to Birmingham, where the Labour-run council is looking at making more than £2 million worth of cuts to services because they went bust. But before that, it's time for another fantastic GB News exclusive. And we can reveal the policing of a huge pro-Palestinian protest in London this weekend will be no different from previous demonstrations. And that's despite Rishi Sunak asking police chiefs on Friday for a call to crack down on those extremists. Hundreds of thousands of people from all over the country are expected to attend yet another Palestine Solidarity campaign march through London this Saturday. But despite Mr Sunak's tough words, GB News has been told that officers will be ordered not to police the protests any differently. It's all a bit confusing, isn't it? Well, I'm joined now by our home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, welcome to the show. Friday, Rishi Sunak said it's time to get tough. Today, they're saying we'll do, we'll do no such thing. Is this, Mark, more evidence of two-tiered policing? Well, it's certainly evidence that the police are not prepared uh, to just listen to the rhetoric of Rishi Sunak and act on that without a change in the law. We heard him, of course, on the steps of Downing Street on Friday evening, uh, very robust in his language, saying that a line had to be drawn, that, of course, there could still be protests in support of Palestine, passionate protests, but no longer, he said, could we tolerate uh, the anti-Semitic messages, the uh, call for the eradication of an entire state, the call for violent jihad, the projection of these hateful messages on Parliament and other buildings. However, uh, sources that uh, we've been speaking to at the Metropolitan Police say that there was nothing indicated from the Prime Minister in terms of any kind of change of law, uh, change of public order law. So they will continue to police as they do these protests under existing public order laws and under the counter-terrorism laws. And those policing uh, operations, uh, this Saturday included, will be consistent with what they have done in the past. Now, Rishi Sunak said that he had spoken to senior police officers earlier last week and he had made it clear to them that the public expects them not simply to manage these protests but to police these protests. Having said that, the Met Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley uh, was speaking at the London Police Board today. He said that uh, he believed that the Met had uh, largely got the um, policing of these protests right, but that it was very difficult to manage, that they are highly uh, political in nature. Um, they are causing a huge strain on the Metropolitan Police in terms of manpower, which is below the target levels at the moment. And he said they get it from both sides, uh, simultaneously called woke from one side and fascist from the other. This is what he told the members of that London policing board. We're obviously operating in a very challenging um, political environment where tensions remain high and um, hate crime is still a long way above pre-October 7th levels. In this context of polarised public debate, um, I do think sometimes that we're the first people who, to be, who are able to be labelled simultaneously woke and fascists. I, I fully understand the strength of feeling, but to suggest that um, we are not where the law permits, as the law allows, policing robustly is inaccurate. We have to police the law um, as it is, not as others would wish it to be. And Mark, at that same meeting, um, London Mayor Sadiq Khan commented, he's come under a lot of criticism, of course, he is the de facto police and crime commissioner of London. In reference to Rishi Sunak saying the police need to get firmer, he kicked back saying the police are doing a good job. And he said, we don't live in North Korea. We don't live in Russia. We live in the UK. Yes, he said protests are a cornerstone of a democracy and he clearly feels that this is the thin edge of the wedge. If there was to be, as Suella Braverman in that exclusive interview with Christopher Hope said earlier today, uh, emergency legislation 
to ban these protests, uh, then that would send completely the wrong message. And according to Sadiq Khan, where would it end? Um, the police as well, they're very clear. You heard it there from Mark Rowley. You know, they police the law as it is, not as others would want. So unless Rishi Sunak is willing uh, to follow up his robust language with actually a change in legislation, it seems the Metropolitan Police are going to continue policing these protests in the manner that they're doing, which is, uh, they say, uh, to go after crime if it's being committed. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to wade in and arrest people on the spot. What they will often do is have evidence gatherers there taking photographs, documenting crimes, and then at a later date, people will be arrested and prosecuted, as frustrating as that understandably is for those that want to see immediate action to stop the likes of the projection of these highly offensive mm. messages onto Parliament. Thank you very much for that analysis, Mark. Why a lot of people would like to see the police stepping up, and a great exclusive there from Tom Fredericks at GB News. Thank you very much. Now, still to come, I've got the latest from the United States, where it's a huge or even huge day in the countdown to the presidential election. But first, in a GB News series, Innovation Britain, we are looking at the successes of the magnificent British manufacturing industry around the country. One of the biggest issues we're facing today in the manufacturing and engineering sectors is the fact that there's a skills shortage and a skills gap. But there's companies out there like this one that are doing something about it. So Paul, what's happening here? Well, here at Incom Training, we deliver engineering and manufacturing apprenticeships. So we start people in their engineering career, like the people we see behind us today. And this year, we've had our biggest intake ever of people going into engineering and manufacturing on an apprenticeship to, to shape their future. So how did we get into this situation in the first place? It, it's a result of generations of people not coming into the sector. Um, we're trying to do something about that. We're trying to show everyone that engineering manufacturing is a great career and apprenticeship is a great route into that career. And how are you doing this? What we're doing at Incom is inspiring young people to come into the sector. There's loads of companies, big and small, within the UK. And these people are whether they want to use their brain or use their hands, they're going into careers that'll last them a lifetime. And it's not just apprenticeships, is it? It's not, no. So we, we are bridging skills gaps through a variety of programmes. Last year, we launched the first ever UK Tool and Academy in partnership with, with Brandara, a Birmingham-based company. And that's for bring, bringing in people who are already engineers to go from here to here through our full-time programme. But you're also upskilling too, aren't you? We are, we are. We launched the UK's first ever tooling academy at our other site. That is about upskilling existing engineers in the tooling sector to go from here to here for a 20 week full time programme. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Nana Queer, weekends from 3 p.m. Sadiq Khan, yeah. 6.3 million on a virtue signal, loading yeah. lines. Why is he spending... The people's money in this way and why is nobody saying yeah. anything i want to hear from suzanne hall the potential conservative candidate yeah. or howard cox the potential reform candidate who could potentially take this off sadiq khan why are they not speaking this is ridiculous it, well it was it was sprung on everybody did you know about that i, I didn't know, know about it nobody knows so they're spending this money is spending yeah. 6.3 million pounds and no one knew about it where's the press where are the public consultations no one knew i think i think it was it's a good idea to rename the train lines because all these train lines mm. are 
Really? So there are like four of them, six of them, whatever, and they're all going all these different directions. And you tell someone to come, and you don't, you don't even know the name. Yeah, but six point three million. Listen, if you want to give me six point three million to come yeah. up with some virtue signaling lies, yeah. I, I'd like to know which advertising agency he employed to do this, how long it took him, yeah. and why, why he's even done it in the first place. Why has he done this? He has done this. We, look, with the virtue signaling, because he's part of Team World. He's Rishi Sunak. He, it's, it's this whole concept is every inclusiveness. There is no country. Nobody's English. Our own history is bad. Our, not my history, but whatever. The English history is bad. And it's a, it's a denial of history. It's Orwellian or something. Yeah. Not I, that I know I about I think it's this. an absolute absurdity that Sadiq Khan should be doing that. He's got a knife crime epidemic, yeah. a crime epidemic, people stealing watches off people walking down yes. the street. Yes. You've got the burglary at an all-time high. London, a lot of people are put off by yeah. it. And this is what he spent six point three million pounds this on. This could have been a bit to speak uh, as to why. Some, but that he doesn't need to speak. People he, he, need to speak out and say, well, yeah. "Why didn't we know about this?" Yeah. But the idea. Can I say something to you, Nana? Mm. The idea is right. It's like, for example, take the Northern Line. You know, there are six Northern Lines. Six Northern Lines. Six different Northern Lines. Yeah, Maybe yeah. more now because one goes from Mill Hill East. So this Mill is Hill. the overground. He was. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Brand new Sundays from 6 p.m. The Neil Oliver Show. It's absolutely vital that people are given the opportunity to take part in the debate, to say the things that matter to them, uh, to be challenged. A country is only really a shared dream. As long as enough people have a shared idea of what it is, then that country exists. What GB News does is give voices somewhere they can be heard. The Neil Oliver Show. Sundays from 6 p.m. on GB News. Welcome back. It's 3.50. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, at 4 o'clock, I'll bring you lots more from that exclusive interview with Suella Bravman. But is this the day that Donald Trump takes a huge step towards becoming the US president again? Well, it's Super Tuesday in America when 16 states will hold Republican primaries. And Trump is already well clear of Nikki Haley in the battle to be that Republican candidate in November's sensational presidential election. Well, to go over this now, I'm joined by Dr. Thomas Gift, who's the founding director of the UCL Center on US Politics. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gift. So all eyes on Super Tuesday for those who aren't familiar with the mechanics of American star voting. In a nutshell, what are we expecting to see at the end of today? How many states vote and how does it all work? Well, thanks so much for having me, Martin. It's great to be with you. Yeah, the Super Tuesday is, as you said, huge, uh, because this is when the most states of any one day come to the ballot box and determine who the nominees are. Of course, in this case, it's a little bit anticlimactic because we already know uh, the answer. But up until this point, we've had a sequence of states, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Michigan, Nevada. Now we're sort of uh, going to see all of these states kind of come together at once. Each of them have slightly different voting rules, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to matter a whole lot. Uh, Donald Trump is well en route to obtaining the nomination. Since the very beginning, he's been framing himself as the inevitable nominee. And it won't become official after Super Tuesday, but unofficially, we all know that this is going to be Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. So correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Gift, but it's about 36% of the total votes, total delegates we will know at the end of today. And we'll get a very, very clear picture then of the direction of travel. It's looking like nobody can stop the Trump train. The courts have tried to do that. Of course, yesterday, the Supreme Court overruled that Colorado ban of him being the primary. With all that in mind, it looks very much, does it not, like we are heading for a rerun of last time around. And at the moment, President Trump-elect Donald looks like the favourite. 
Well, 70 percent of Americans don't want a Donald Trump versus Joe Biden rematch. And yet, ironically, that's exactly where you're trending. So you're absolutely correct. And when you look at the polls, both nationally and state by state in key uh, swing states, battlegrounds where this election is going to be determined, Donald Trump absolutely has uh, the edge. Nationally, he's up by about four percentage points. And then state by state, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, uh, Georgia, all those places, he's looking pretty good at the moment. Uh, of course, that's combined with extremely low poll numbers for Joe Biden. He's sort of sub 40 percent at this point, around 38, 39, depending on the polls. So if you're Donald Trump, you've got to be optimistic about where you are right now. And if you're Joe Biden, I think you have to be realistic about sort of uh, the reality of the situation. And in a nutshell, if we could, Dr. Gift, there's going to be one heck of a temper tantrum, isn't there, stateside, if Donald Trump gets in again? Well, I think the left is certainly going to go psychotic. Uh, and I actually don't even really want to think about uh, what that might look like in the context of a potentially contested election, regardless of who wins. I think that there are going to be uh, Democrats and Republicans saying that the other side stole the election, that it was somehow uh, illegitimate. Um, you know, both sides, of course, are going to get lawyered up in case it does go down to the courts. And given the fact that you know, this will ultimately be decided by five or six states, all of which are probably within the statistical margin of error, we could be looking ahead to, to recounts and sort of a redux of what we saw in 2020, and then before that, back to 20, 2000 okay. um, with uh, Bush and Gore. So it's okay. something to look We at. have to leave it there. Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas Gift. Excellent analysis. All eyes on America tonight. Now, GB News can reveal that the police won't change their approach to this weekend's huge pro-Palestine protest in London, despite pleas from Rishi Sunak. And in another GB News exclusive, Suella Bravman says the police have got to get tough with those protesters. We need to see action, she says. I'm Martin Dordney on GB News, but first, here's time for your weather forecast with Alex Deacon. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. A few heavy showers around this afternoon, but they're going to fade through this evening. Most of us having a dry night, some fog and frost in the southwest. That's where we've had the clearest skies through the day. Still some heavy showers across the southeast. They'll tend to drift away. A few scattered showers across parts of Scotland, but for most it's a dry night. We'll keep quite a lot of cloud in the east. That will help to keep the temperatures up here. But further west, with the clearer skies, temperatures are going to dip down close to freezing, a frost likely in rural parts of Wales and southwest England, along with some freezing fog patches. They could linger through the morning at Russia, parts of the M4 and the M5 in particular, so bear that in mind. But they should clear away, and then much of the west will have a fine day on Wednesday. Main exception to that being Cornwall, where there will be more cloud and a few showers. In the east, again, quite a lot of cloud, and we'll see a few showers over parts of eastern England, a bit of rain over the uh, Grampians as well. A chilly day on some of those eastern coasts, six, seven degrees, but further west, a bit of sunshine, double digits, maybe 12 Celsius. Thursday will be a similar day in that western areas will see the, the lion's share of the dry and bright weather. Always more clouds in the east. A few more heavy showers likely on Thursday, though, particularly over parts of the Midlands and Wales. One or two lively downpours possible. Again, where it's gloomy and glum, temperatures in single digits, where we see a bit of brightness, temperatures should climb to double figures, maybe up into the teens in one or two places. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four, GB News is Britain's election channel.
We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven, and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text PRIZE to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. A very good afternoon to you all. It's 4 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK today. There's a cracking exclusive interview with Suella Braverman. She's talked about the pro-Palestine protests and said that the time for words has come to an end and we need to see action. Next up, after all the rumours and speculation about the Princess of Wales, I'll bring you a big update on when she's going to return to royal duty. A good news story. And after the Church of England gets ready to set aside an astonishing £1 billion to pay for slavery reparations, I'll speak to the vicar who says the people who wrote the controversial report appear to have a death wish for the Church of England. And that's all coming up in your next action-packed hour. So welcome to the show. It's always an absolute pleasure to have your company, the Suella Bravman exclusive is, exclusive is an absolute corker. Lee Anderson, no go zones for Jewish people in London. We need to crack down on these protests, income tax cuts, you name it. She's rolling out a red meat buffet. But the big question is, is she the solution to the Tory party's woes or by going further to the right? Would it make the party unelectable? Get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.com. I want to hear your thoughts on that. We'll have a big debate on that after this. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you, and good afternoon to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom is that the Chancellor looks set to unveil a two-pence cut to national insurance contributions as he prepares to set out tomorrow's budget. Jeremy Hunt will attempt to put the UK's economy back on track and revive Rishi Sunak's popularity, despite the fiscal watchdog giving the government little headroom for tax cuts. Analysts suggest the NHS could be facing real-term funding cuts of £2 billion amid rising costs and a promise to tackle waiting lists. 
Liberal Democrats leader Sir Ed Davies says the rising cost of living ought to be the priority. The truth is the Conservatives increased uh, taxes. Any tax cuts will really be a deception and a swindle on the British people because the vast majority of people are paying much higher taxes thanks to the Conservatives. Well, what Liberal Democrats want to see in the budget tomorrow is uh, an end to the cuts in the NHS. We're about to see the worst cuts in the NHS since the 1970s. And the choice uh, at the next election is going to be a Conservative chance, a Conservative government who want to cut our NHS, or Liberal Democrats, Liberal Democrat candidates who want to make sure we protect our NHS. That's our top priority. Sir Davey. Well, the business minister, Greg Hans, told GB News the government is being responsible. The government intervened well and correctly over recent years, for example, during the pandemic, in terms of the supporting people to remain in employment. Uh, the fact the government paid a big part of people's energy bills over the last couple of winters, I think people support that. Um, that is uh, why there's been an increase in public spending. Uh, but, as I said earlier, the economy is now turning a corner and that then sets us up nicely to be able to afford things like tax cuts. Suella Braverman has told GB News that she doesn't believe the former Tory MP Lee Anderson is Islamophobic. Today's exclusive interview with the former Home Secretary comes after Mr Anderson claimed Islamists had got control of the London Mayor. Lee Anderson is a, a great colleague of mine. I th I'm totally abhor the accusations that have been launched against him. He is not racist. He is not Islamophobic. He's calling out very poor performance by the mayor of London, who has completely failed to hold the Met Commissioner to account, and which is why we've seen emboldened Islamism in the streets of London. We've seen an MP hounded out of office because of Islamism. We've seen Parliament uh, totally subverted and the proper procedures abused uh, out of fear. Meanwhile, the policing of a pro-Palestine protest in London this weekend will remain unchanged, despite the Prime Minister's call for a crackdown on extremists. Officers will reportedly use existing public order and anti-terror laws without a change to their approach on the streets. And that's after Rishi Sunak called on police to draw a line and clamp down on extremist behaviour. But Met Police Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley says officers must enforce the law as it's written. We're obviously operating in a very challenging um, political environment where tensions remain high and um, hate crime is still a long way above pre-October 7th levels. In this context of polarised public debate, um, I do think sometimes that we're the first people who, to be, who are able to be labelled simultaneously woke and fascists. We have to police the law um, as it is, not as others would wish it to be. Sir Mark Rowley. Now, police have named a 10-year-old girl who was found dead in the West Midlands. The body of Shay Kang was discovered with injuries at an address near Birmingham yesterday afternoon. She was described as a bright and fun-loving little girl. A 33-year-old woman understood to be known to her has been arrested and taken into custody. Now, an agreement on a revised offer for hospital consultants in England has been reached in a potential step towards solving the ongoing dispute. Unions will now recommend the offer to their members ahead of a vote that's expected soon. The Health Secretary says it paves the way for an end to the strikes, while the Prime Minister said it is proof that seeking a fair agreement is the best way forward for everyone. A separate dispute involving junior doctors, though, is still ongoing. And finally, if you're a fan of soap operas in the 1990s, you may just remember this. Yes, it became the world's most watched TV series during its original run. Can't think why, but now those red bathing suits and those slow motion jogs along the Californian beaches are set to return. A new series of Baywatch has been commissioned by US network Fox. It's going to see a whole new generation of lifeguards embarking on daring ocean rescues. The original series ran for a decade from 1989 until 99 and made superstars of all its cast, including David Hasselhoff and Pammy Anderson. It's expected to premiere this autumn. For the latest stories, do sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts.
Thank you, Polly. Now, I've got so much still to get through this on the show so far, but there's only one place to start. And, of course, it's our exclusive interview with the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. And she's told us that while she welcomed the content of Rishi Sunak's speech, you recall, on Friday, it is time for the Prime Minister to accompany his rhetoric with action. And she also said it is unacceptable that there are no-go areas for Jewish people in 21st century Britain. Well, I'm joined now in our studio in Westminster by our political correspondent, Olivia Early. Olivia, a red meat buffet, British taxes for British people, tax foreign workers more, sticking it for Lee Anderson, no-go areas for Jewish people, give the police more powers, cut income tax. She's saying all the right things, a naked play to be the future Tory leader? Well, it does feel a little bit like that, I'd say, Martin. It is certainly a, a red meat interview that she's given here, as you say. She said that she would cut the uh, basic rate of income tax by 2p. Now, that would be huge. It would be very, very popular. But Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Zunak have said from the beginning that it would also be inflationary and very expensive indeed. Saying that you would take 2p off the basic rate of income tax is... Pretty easy when you're a Tory backbencher, yeah. not quite so easy when you're the Chancellor, but I'm sure it will go down very well indeed with Conservative backbenchers. She did make an attempt, though, to explain how she would pay for it, and one of those uh, ways would be to levy a tax on foreign workers. Now, it would essentially be to tax companies who are employing foreigners. Now, there are lots of Conservatives, both within the party and outside of it, who see the logic in that. There are a lot of Brits in the UK who are out out of work and it's sort of a rehashing of the idea of British jobs for British workers, an idea which plays pretty well in quite a lot of Tory seats in the country. She also talked about anti-Semitism in London specifically. Uh, her husband is from Jewish heritage and she was always very strong on this when she was Home Secretary. Let's just have a listen to what she had to say. Well, welcome words. I wouldn't disagree with uh, you know, his words. But, you know, I think the time for words has come to an end and we do need to see action. You know, the next day we saw tens of thousands of people take to the streets, chanting hateful slogans and behaving in a totally unacceptable way in many instances, overwhelming the police, notably, where police resource has been disproportionate to actually what's happening. So I, we need to say, see a step change in the police response. They need to be enforcing the law. They need to be arresting people who are using threatening or abusive language. We need to be holding the police to account in a better way. And I would have liked to have seen an emergency law introduced to actually empower ministers and empower uh, all of those policymakers who are uh, responsible for this issue to actually take uh, steps to restrict some of these marches. You know, this has been going on now for four months. It's become a weekly fixture. Parts of London have become, uh, uh, you know, no-go areas for Jewish people. Uh, that is totally unacceptable. We've seen anti-Semitism skyrocket. That cannot be the case in 21st century Britain, and therefore it's, a it's time for action, mm. not words. Olivia Paul Scully said no-go zones were uh, apparent in parts of London last week. He came under fire for it. So Ella doubled down on the specific context of Jewish people and saying things like we need emergency powers for the police, states of emergency. Again, this will land very well with the right of the party. Well, absolutely. Essentially, in this interview, she's going to be just taking things that little bit further than she did as Home Secretary. We knew when she was Home Secretary there was tension between her and Mark Rowley, the Commissioner of the Met Police, over how far the police would go to uh, make sure that these protests didn't become violent. There was, a, there was an argument. I mean, we didn't quite see it, but behind the scenes, we knew this was going on. There was an open letter from Suella Bravman about whether uh, police should arrest people who use the Sloan for, slogan, uh, from the river mm. to the sea, Palestine will be free. And Suella Bravman felt that this was hate speech. The Met Police made the decision that people would only be arrested when using that phrase if they were, if it would be context dependent, if they were uh, in front of a Jewish school or in front of a synagogue uh, or, or anything like that. But using the phrase on its own was not deemed by the Met Police to be hate speech. And so they wouldn't be arresting people uh, for that. And you could say that. 
that sort of empowered things like that slogan being uh, reflected on the on the on the wall of Big Ben. So perhaps you know Suella Bravman would say here that she has essentially been proved right. Now this idea of having sort of emergency legislation in place, well that's an interesting one because I think there is a legitimate argument that actually the police have all the mm. powers that they need to make sure that these protests don't become violent, don't uh, cross over into hate speech. But are they really using them? I thought that Suella Bravman seemed to have her messages a little bit mixed up there. On the one hand, she was saying that she would like to see the uh, police use their powers more. And on the other hand, she was saying we need to bring in more emergency yeah. legislation. Well, if the legislation's there and the police aren't using them, what do we need more legislation for? And we talk often, don't we, um, Olivia, about they have the bill, do they have the will to enforce it? And in fact, Mark Rowley today pushed back against this, saying we're in a challenging political environment. And that man, Sadiq Khan, has weighed in. Of course, he came under a lot of fire from Lee Anderson about letting the protesters run riot. And he stepped in, saying ostensibly when politicians try and interfere in policing like this, it's not right. The Prime Minister is saying to the police today which marches to allow and which marches to ban. What's to stop him tomorrow telling the police who to arrest, who to charge and who to prosecute? Then makes the point, we don't live in North Korea, we don't live in Russia, we live in the UK. Well, I think that's a, a really interesting point. And obviously, in this country, we do have uh, the right to protest freely. And it should be, obviously, up to the police to police these marches. But we have seen politicians, Suella Bravman, Rishi Sunak, remind reminding police how far their powers go. And I think there are quite a lot of people in the UK who think that politicians are within their right to do that. They are not saying, as as the mayor uh, is suggesting here, uh, that Rishi Sunak isn't saying who to arrest. He is simply reminding the police of the powers that they have to intervene if these marches stray too far into disrupting everyday life, making Jews in London uh, feel uncomfortable. So it's a really interesting line there. And I felt like in this interview, Suella Bravman did push it a little bit further than she was prepared to do when she was actually Home Secretary. Might get her into a bit of a difficult situation, but perhaps a sticky situation if she were in the position of being a leader of the Conservative Party after an election. Which is what she may be hoping for. Olivia Lee, excellent as ever. Thank you very much. Now, moving on, a recent poll gave voters information about policies of three possible Conservative leaders, mysteriously named candidates X. Candidates Y and Candidate Z. Well, the most popular option was Candidate X. And Candidate X, they, well, they backed Brexit, they want lower immigration, and they would abandon the target to reach net zero by 2050. And guess what? Well, it turns out that Candidate, Candidate X was based on none other than that woman, Suella Braverman. So, with that in mind, could she save the Conservatives? Well, I'm, to go over this now, I'm joined by the political consultant, Alex Dean. Alex, welcome to the show. Hello. The mysteriously named candidate X sounds like your red meat Brexiteer, Suella Braverman, and in that poll was polling very high, came in with 34% of the votes. Candidate Y, however, who backed Brexit but wants higher immigration, 19%, they fared the worst. Candidate Z, a Remainer, who opposes tax cuts and backs net zero, basically a Liberal Democrat, got 22%. With all of that in mind, Alex, the big question is, if a candidate like Suella Braverman is landing the best with the electorate, is Suella Braverman the candidate who should be leading the Conservative Party? We shouldn't be switching leader in the Conservative Party. Uh, we've got to make a pragmatic uh, wake up and smell the coffee moment and, and realise we'd look completely ridiculous if, if we switch leader again. We've, we've had in a single parliament Boris Johnson to Liz Truss to Rishi Sunak. Um, now is the time for all good men and women to come to the aid of the party. And uh, we mustn't put personal ambitions ahead of what we uh, aspire to for our country, and we mustn't put personal ambitions ahead of what we uh, wish for the best for our party. I believe as firmly as I know that Tuesday uh, comes after Monday, that this country is better off under a Conservative government than it would be under the Labour Party. And we all know, uh, whatever an individual piece of polling research shows, however, no matter how interesting, divided parties don't win elections. If we go to the polls squabbling about who is leading us, uh, then we make our situation even worse.
But Alex, if we put all of that to one side and just simply look at the data, look at the metrics, look at the way the runes are falling. A poll came out 7 p.m. last night. Conservatives on their lowest polling in 46 years. Labour on 47, yeah, well, Conservatives on 20. And so, therefore, the counterpoint to yours would be why stick with what we've got if what we've got looks to be heading for oblivion? Because I don't accept your premise. I don't accept your therefore, and I don't accept that they're facts. You, you said polls say that people say well, how they would vote tomorrow, but there's not going to be an election tomorrow. The election's going to be when the government calls it, most likely October or November. Consider this. Think about all the fuss we've had about George Galloway and his arrival in Parliament. He's going to have precisely as long before the general election as the government has got to change uh, the agenda. I accept who, who can not, looking at current polling, the Conservative Party is not doing well in the public mind, but we've got months to turn it around, and we must. So we're not going to have an election uh, tomorrow. And, and as for the point about polling, you know, God bless him. Your channel just uh, showed us Ed Davey suggesting with a straight face that the realistic alternative were offered to the country were a Conservative government or a Liberal Democrat government. I mean, if we're going to entertain that prospect, I can at least say the current government may win, right? Yeah, but there's polls and there's fantasy land. But back to tomorrow. We don't have an election tomorrow, but we do have a budget tomorrow. A lot of people will be expecting an end to the endless misery of inflation, high taxes, the highest taxes since World War II. We were promised conservatism. It feels like we've got Corbynism. Well, I give you two things that I think as a tax cutting conservative myself. The first is that national insurance is a fraud perpetuated upon the public. People think they're paying into a pot that is going to wait for them at the uh, end of their careers, a retirement pot they've built up with the state. And that's not true. There is no correlation between what you pay in in national insurance and what you get at the end. The best interpretation, and people might think it's fine as a kind of communitarian idea, we are paying in now as people in work to pay for the retirement of those who are uh, at the, uh, the end of their careers. Some people might think that's reasonable, but we should at least be honest about what's happening with NI. So the lower you can get NI, in my view, the better. But the second thing I think, Martin, is that we should stop this uh, fiscal drag of the thresholds never being moved upwards so that people are paying ever more tax and being pulled into higher tax brackets. If the Chancellor can deal with either or both of those things tomorrow, I'll be delighted. OK, superb analysis. As ever, thank you very much, Alex Dean, for your input. And, of course, to Olivia Utley, thank you very much. Now, one thing that Swella Bradman said was that firms that rely on foreign workers should pay more in tax to help bring down net migration. Well, let's cross now to Downing Street and speak to our political editor, Christopher Hope. That's right, Martin. I put that question, that actual question, to the n number Ted, to the PM's deputy official spokesman, to ask them: Would you agree to try and uh, tax more companies which take on more foreign workers? She wouldn't comment ahead of the budget. The budget's tomorrow, of course. That's where they're where able to see the chancellor behind us holding up the red box uh, tomorrow. We've been less than 24 hours today. They did say that the plans they've announced already, the government, will bring uh, net migration down by 300,000 from the figure of 740. 5,000 uh, for the, for the, uh, the calendar year 2022. So that's the hope. That's what they're planning to do. The, so far, the, the idea has been put to number 10, but so far they're batting it back, saying they can get along quite just fine without Sir Braman's ideas. OK, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Thank you very much. Live from Downing Street, Chris Hope. We'll have more from you, of course, in the next hour on that cracking exclusive. Now, you could win the Spring Essentials in our latest Great British Giveaway. Not Chris Hope. You can't win him. He's not for sale. There's a garden gadget package, a shopping spree, and £12,345 in cash. One, two, three, four, five. And here's all the details. We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven, and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner, just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats, 
and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Cracking stuff gets stuck in. Now, if you live in Birmingham, then public services are going to be slashed after the council there went bust. And first Birmingham, could it be your town or city next? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. Well, to cut a very long story uh, short, I was the chaplain in, in a school and uh, a pupil asked me to preach on how come they were told they had to accept uh, the LGBT stuff in a Christian school. I thought that was a fair question. So I said, ultimately, no, you don't have to accept anybody else's ideas. You make up your own minds uh, and so on topics like uh, the marriage being between a man and a woman, biological sex being real, gender identity not making perfect sense, therefore can't be entirely true. I said, you know, you may adopt to the church's position on that and um, respect the people you disagree with, but you make up your own mind, um, for which, as you say, I was reported to prevent the anti-terror watchdog, um, secular safeguarding authorities, the teaching regulation agency, disclosure and borrowing service, all of whom eventually cleared me, uh, but I lost my job at the school and that's why there's legal action ongoing. That's an incredibly say. powerful sermon, <laughs> to be fair. Um, uh, what do you make of Justin Welby and his current role? I've obviously rattled off quite a few things there. I mean, you've had personal experience of feeling quite abandoned. What's your view on his position? Well, I, he's doing a very difficult job, in fairness to him. My personal view is perhaps he's not doing the best job of it. Um, I'll, I'll be diplomatic about it. In a sense, I'm on the wrong side of things as far as he's concerned, I guess. Um, not a, not a word of support, not a whisper from anyone in the Church of England's hierarchy for someone simply saying, you may accept the Church of England's own teaching. And, and I can't quite see how he can square that in his own head, but you know, he would have to answer to that himself, I guess. I, I mean, the irony is that, uh, though this is obviously through no fault of your own, the Church of England has recently baptised people who have gone on to not just be referred to prevent, but actually commit acts of terrorism. Meanwhile, you were referred to prevent for essentially uh, teaching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 4.26. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, after all the rumours and speculation, I've got some big news about the Princess of Wales a little later this hour, and it's a good news story.
before that, Birmingham City Councillors are meeting right now to discuss whether to approve budget cuts of more than £200 million. And it comes after the council effectively declared itself bankrupt last year. Well, let's cross live now to Birmingham and speak to our West Bidders reporter, Jack Carson. Jack, we're expecting a whopping 5% increase in council tax in Birmingham because they effectively went bankrupt. What's the latest? Well, Martin, it'll be even more than 5%. It's 9.99% wow. just for this year, and then that then increases into next year. And so over the next two years, it's a total rise of 21% for Birmingham residents. That is on top, of course, of all of the cuts that are coming that the council um, in the building behind me are voting on now. The meeting which I've been uh, in attendance to this afternoon is quite extraordinary. Um, Councillor John Cotton, of course, the leader of, of Birmingham City Council, saying that he apologises to the people and communities of this city, but much of his statement opening uh, this debate on the budget was about uh, the Conservatives calling the Birmingham Tories the cheerleaders for austerity and saying that it's the impact of, of greater national government, which is why um, Birmingham is, not, is in such a great financial mess. But the Birmingham Conservatives are uh, hitting back, saying um, they, Labour promised a golden decade for Birmingham, not delivering uh, on that and pointing out that back in 2022, the then leader of this council said that Birmingham's finances had never been in such a great position in 30 years. So things maybe weren't adding up, but quite extraordinary in that meeting as this budget vote uh, continues. But, of course, it's the residents where these council tax increases and these cuts to services uh, are going to be impacting. I spoke to a few people on the streets earlier today. Nobody's happy. Any, who's going to be happy with it? Nobody's going to be happy with it. We're all hardworking people. We're struggling as it is. Uh, everything's going up. Um, our wages are going up slightly, inflation is coming down, but people are struggling and we're getting fed up. I think it's disgusting. The cost of living has risen already as it is and we are all struggling, so most of us. So putting it up by 10% even more is really going to affect me. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that the, the Birmingham City Council couldn't you know, take care of the funding that they had. So bin collections as well are going to become fortnightly from next year and the council are also going to dim the street lights in order to try and save almost a million pounds. There are dark days ahead, Martin, for the second city. Jack Carlson, excellent live from Birmingham. And now let's cut to Myrion Jenkins, who's the Conservative councillor for the Sutton Mere Green area in Birmingham and is the shadow member of finance. Welcome to the show, Myrion. So eye-watering rises in ta council tax there, 10% plus millions of pounds of debt. How on earth did we get to this position? Yeah, well, well I'm afraid, and it's quite right, it'll be 21% over two years. Uh, which would be the compounding effect of two increases of 10%. Um, we got to this position, Martin, because of a decade of mismanagement by the Labour administration. I've been a councillor since 2012, and I've seen numerous failures in terms of financial management. But th what's really pushed it over the edge just recently is their failure to manage the requirements of equal pay legislation and also their failure to implement a new accounting system Called, called Oracle, um, which has gone so badly. The original budget was 20 million. It's now going to exceed 100 million. Nobody really knows how much it's going to cost in the end. And after three years, we're still not in a position where officers can get reliable financial information out of the system. We're having to employ temporary clerks to allocate cash so we cannot effectively re even reconcile the bank. And the consequence of this is that the auditors cannot sign off the accounts. So we don't really know what the true financial position of Birmingham is. And when you combine that with approximately 800 million of equal pay costs, again, nobody's sure what the final figure is, but it's going to be a huge number. You put those two together, that's what finally pushed the council into bankruptcy. It's, it's crass, chronic mismanagement of finances. And, and I will say, Martin, that the worst possible thing they could do now is give this Labour administration another 21% of taxpayers' money, because they've yeah. proven themselves to be quite incapable of looking after taxpayers' money. And the last thing we should do is give them even more. It's absolutely astonishing. 21% rises in council tax over two years. 
eye-watering, astonishing, unaffordable. The poor residents of Birmingham City must be absolutely devastated about what's a huge financial rise. Thank you very much for joining us. Marion Jenkins is a Conservative Council for Sutton Mere Green in Birmingham and the shadow member of finance. Thanks for joining us on the show. Okay. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and five o'clock, and I'll speak to the Church of England vicar who said paying £1 billion in slavery reparations would be anti-Christian. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. The top stories this hour, a 42-year-old man has admitted starting a fire at the constituency office belonging to Conservative MP Mike Freer on Christmas Eve. These details just coming to us. Paul Harwood denies the attack was politically motivated but pleaded guilty to two charges of arson at the Old Bailey. A second person, 32-year-old defendant Zara Kayseri, denied the charges. Both defendants have been remanded in custody. A further hearing has now been set for March the 12th. And it follows the Justice Minister's announcement he's quitting politics after being the target of several death threats. In other news today, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, looks set to unveil a two-pence cut to national insurance as he prepares to set out Britain's budget tomorrow. The Chancellor attempting to put the UK's economy back on track and revive Rishi Sunak's popularity despite the fiscal watchdog giving the government little room for tax cuts. And police have also named a 10-year-old little girl who's been found dead in the West Midlands. The body of Shay Kang was discovered with injuries at an address near Birmingham yesterday afternoon. A 33-year-old woman, understood to be known to the girl, has been arrested and taken into custody. And GB News can reveal that the policing of a pro-Palestinian protest in London this weekend will remain unchanged, despite the Prime Minister's call for a crackdown on extremists. Officers will reportedly use existing public order and anti-terror laws without a change to their approach on the streets. In a rare speech outside Downing Street last week, Krishi Sunak called on police to draw a line and clamp down on extremist behaviour. And if you've been having trouble accessing Facebook or even Instagram this afternoon, you're not the only one. The company Meta says it has been hit with outages all over the world, with more than 300,000 reports of people locked out of the sites. A spokesperson for Meta says the company's working to fix the issue and in some territories it is now resolved. For the very latest stories, do sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Thank you, Polly. Now, as the police try to tackle violence against women and girls, the UK's most senior police officer has made a major, has made a major admission. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. We're always told that there is a, a huge need for care workers in Britain. We're always told that the salaries just aren't big enough against the benefit system for British people to want to do that work. And, and there probably is some real truth in that. Uh, and yet, if up to 25% of those that come are acting illegally, and it would seem up until now uh, that in some areas, foreign care workers come in but bring in almost the same number of family members with them, that we need to have a proper debate about this. I'm very pleased to be joined by Mike Padgham, chair of the Independent Care Group. If I accept those arguments for a moment, how can it be that the system is so lax that up to 25% are found by the inspector of borders and immigration to be working illegally? Well, good evening to you, Nigel. It was good to join you. I mean, those figures are shocking to me. When I looked at it um, today, when I saw that uh, 275 visas had been issued to a care home that didn't even exist, and uh, a further over 1,000 people joined a company that only had uh, previously four staff in it, it makes me wonder the bureaucracy of the Home Office didn't think to check that these companies exist in the first place, because it should be quite straightforward. If people are providing care, they're regulated by the Care Quality Commission. It's a simple phone call to check and double check. Sadly, there seems to have been very many loopholes at the beginning. I believe that's been tightened now. 
But I can't understand it because all the providers that are doing it in the proper way have to go through quite a, a, a rigmarole to actually get approved, and it takes months. So it, it beggars belief that this has happened and people have, have, have been approved for a company that doesn't even exist. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my new show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m., where real people get to meet those in power and hold them to account. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country in the real world. Join me at seven on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Brand new Sundays from 6 p.m. The Neil Oliver Show. It's absolutely vital that people are given the opportunity to take part in the debate, to say the things that matter to them, uh, to be challenged. A country is only really a shared dream. As long as enough people have a shared idea of what it is, then that country exists. What GB News does is give voices somewhere they can be heard. The Neil Oliver Show. Sundays from 6 p.m. on GB News. There's less than 24 hours to go now until the budget, and we'll be doing two special shows live from Whitehaven tomorrow to find out what you, the great British public, thinks. And you can be part of the audiences for Jubes & Co and the Nigel Farage show. To get your tickets, go to gbnews.com. Now to a warning from the UK's most senior police officer. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley has said combating violence against women and girls will need the same level of funding as the fight against terrorism or organised crime. Sir Mark told the London Policing Board today that there are hundreds of thousands of men in Britain who are threats to women and girls, and he's added that the scale of the problem means it has to be treated as a threat to national security. But he was speaking a few hours before the BBC as a documentary into the murder of Sarah Everard by a serving Metropolitan Police officer. Well, joining me now to discuss this is the former Met police officer, Peter Kirkham. Peter, welcome to the show. So the conversation of late, of course, has been on the oversight of how somebody like Cousins could have got away with it. And now when we're looking at the broader policing of this, we are faced with an astronomical issue and an astronomical cost. But nevertheless, it's a task we must rise to, Peter. Yes, it's obviously an extremely serious aspect of crime. Um, and the numbers are mind boggling. Um, but the numbers are mind boggling in an awful lot of different areas of policing. We've never had uh, funding provided specifically for particular areas. Uh, perhaps with the exception of terrorism, which has always been funded as a separate entity. Uh, but to fund uh, the policing of violence against women and girls, bearing in mind it covers such a wide range of different types of violence. There might be domestic violence, there might be stranger rape, uh, there might be paedophilia, there might be any number of different angles uh, from which offenders come and which offences take place. Uh, it, it's, it's quite difficult to understand how that money would be ring-fenced. What the mm. police are suffering from is a general, generic lack of funding for everything. Um, mm. And you can't do anything properly when you haven't got the money to do it. And Peter, on to the comments about politicians getting involved in how policing is operated. Um, we've seen, of course, Rishi Sunak gave that address on Friday, imploring the police to police differently on the Palestinian protests. And today, Mark Rowley said that's not going to happen. Sadiq Khan wading in saying when politicians get involved in policing, that's the thin end of the wedge of places like Russia or North Korea. What's your thoughts on that? I'm sure if with Sadiq Khan on this, the police are independent of politicians uh, and of politics and of government and of everybody else, really. They're independent officer holders under the crown. 
and they are solely responsible for the decisions about the exercise of their powers, powers of arrest and such like. Now, yeah, of course, the politicians provide guidance and they provide a framework and they provide the budgets. And so they influence an awful lot of policing uh, in those indirect ways. But when it comes to comments like those of the prime minister, which are basically criticising the police for uh, not making arrests or for uh, permitting protesters to hold up particular signs, then we are muddying the waters between the separation of powers. The politicians through parliament and the government through parliament make the laws. When those laws are in place, the police then police according to those laws. And they can only police according to those laws. And they are, yes, they can push the boundaries to see where those laws start and finish, but they can't act in a way that has been made clear or is clear is in excess of the law. So an awful lot of the criticism has been around the nature of particular chants, the wording of particular chants, the imagery on particular boards. So, for instance, the definition of the word jihad. It is being argued that the police should just arrest anybody that calls for jihad, which ignores the fact that jihad has different meanings. And the police will look at that and say, if we arrested these people and put them before the courts, what are the courts going to say? The courts are going to say, jihad's got lots of meanings. And so if the government wants jihad full stop to be made unlawful, pass an act of parliament that says that, and then the police can exercise that power to arrest those people and put them in front of the courts and the courts will convict them. Until that time, the police are bound by the interpretation of law by the courts and the judgment of the courts about the nature of particular words and phrases. But, but, but you see, P Peter, a lot of people disagree with that because the interpretation at ground level seems to be, and the evidence is manifest, I've seen it with my own two eyes, I went out there Parliament Square last week, and that is the old bill are standing at arm's length when it comes to the Palestinian protests. We saw all the weekend those protesters whacking coppers with sticks, shoving them, the police simply standing off. You know full well, Peter, if that was white working-class football fans, they'd all be getting nicked. We, we People feel we are seeing two-tier policing, Peter. That simply isn't true, Martin. I've been there on a number of occasions myself over the years, and the police tolerate a certain amount of pushing and shoving um, and, and, and abuse to, directed towards them uh, and those sorts of low-level offences because practically it's impossible to deal with all of that and maintain peace and order on the streets. Everyone that's arrested takes officers away from the protest. There aren't an excess number of police officers present at the protest to start with, so any significant number of arrests mean the protest now isn't being policed at all. It can't be kept to its particular route and such like, and so things rapidly get out of hand. Now, the follow-up, there is more time for considered opinion to be taken, legal opinion to be taken, on the nature of particular chants and placards and such like. And then, if necessary, efforts can be made to find those people responsible. In a case like this, where the marches are taking place week after week after week, chances are, if someone needed to be arrested for something that happened last week, uh, then they're going to pop up again next week or the week after. And so they are going to be able to be followed up. You, you can't expect everybody to be picked up at the same time. And it, it's simply wrong to say that the police wouldn't tolerate pushing and shoving and things like that in the normal course of events. They do every single week. OK, super. Former Mets police officer Peter Kirkham, your huge experience is always valued. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. Now, after all the rumours and speculation, there's big news today about the Princess of Wales. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Jacob rees and this is GB News, Britain's News Channel. Jacob Rees Mogg's State of the Nation, Monday to Thursday from 8 pm. You're now in exile. I imagine it wouldn't be safe for you to go 
back to Russia. Can I ask you if you feel safe personally, uh, and what do you think can be done to remove Putin, or is he going to be there for as long as he wants? Uh, I think that's, that is, of course, fundamental question. It is uh, there should be pressure inside Russia and outside. Inside Russia right now, it's impossible because Putin put all leaders in jail and some of us just abroad, you know, just two were already killed. Mr. Nemtsov, Boris Nemtsov, my friend, my collaborator on my party, was, was killed on the walls on Kremlin. Alexei Navalny was killed in jail and in the camp. And that is the, the people live in fear and the fear to identify themselves as a protesters, to identify themselves as against Putin's regime, etc. That's why today there is no no chance for opposition to raise in, inside Russia. But outside, of course, this war against Ukraine, that is the fundamental issue for all foreign leaders. And in fact, just support of Ukraine and to not to let Putin to, to, to destroy Ukraine, to defeat, destroy, uh, to defeat uh, uh, Ukraine, that is an important issue. Because just Ukraine, that's not just in Ukraine, war in Ukraine. Ukraine just fighting for their territorial integrity, but fighting for the whole European countries. Because after Ukraine, other countries could appear. Other uh, subject of uh, aggression could be. And Putin easily could try to test Article 5 of NATO, NATO charter. It could, it could, well, be, could be one of the small countries of uh, Baltic states. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 4.48. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, at 5 o'clock, I'll have more from our exclusive interview with Suella Bravman and find out what she's had to say about the ECHR. Spoiler, not a fan. Now, the Princess of Wales is to carry out her first major engagement since her operation when she reviews Trooping the Colour, according to the Army's official website. And it comes as Kate Middleton was seen in public for the first time since her abdominal surgery in January, alongside her mother, Carol Middleton. Well, joining us now to discuss this is GB News' royal correspondent, Cameron Walker. Cameron, great news. It appears Kate's on the mend. Well, it does on the surface, but you dig into it and perhaps it's not all as it seems, I'm afraid. There's a lot of confusion uh, this afternoon. It appears, as you said, the British Army published on their website that for the final Trooping the Colour rehearsal the week before the King's Birthday Parade, it is the Princess of Wales scheduled to review uh, the troops as Colonel of the Irish Guards. However... Kensington Palace, I understand, was not consulted before the army published that information. And the guidance I'm getting is that it is the palace alone who will confirm whether the princess is or is not attending. So it appears, actually, that there's no guarantee that the princess is going to be there. So although it looks like a promising bit of good news, we actually haven't had any confirmation about that. But then, as you said, we've got this uh, unauthorised paparazzi photograph of her as well. Seems like a bit of a gaffe. I mean, really, the public are just crying out for some good news, crying out for confirmation, and instead we seem to have this kind of disinformation or kind of half-baked information coming into the public sphere, Cameron. Yeah, the last official bit of information we got about the Princess of Wales's health was that she is unlikely to return to public duties until after Easter. So that's almost a month away, um, to be honest. But this void has been created by this lack of information, and in its place we have got conspiracy theories and social media speculation. And even since this paparazzi photograph, which we're not going to show here on GB News, um, has gone viral on the internet, even it's added fuel to the fire 
here, and even more speculation and rumor, and rumor has come out as to whether or it is or isn't the Princess of Wales. First of all, was it staged? The answer is no, it wasn't, um, and and things like that. So it's just adding to the again the hashtag Kate Middleton. Uh, and if anything, it's just obviously a invaded the princess's privacy. But the palace at the moment, Martin, really struggling to contain this, and is really struggling to protect the princess's privacy in this digital age. OK, thank you for that update. Cameron Walker, and we wish the princess, of course, a speedy recovery. Now to the hugely controversial call for the Church of England to pay £1 billion in slavery reparations. And it comes from an independent review that was commissioned by the church itself. And joining us now is the theologian, author and speaker, Dr Ian Paul. Thank you for joining us, Dr Paul. I understand you think this is decidedly unchristian. Could you explain to us, please? Yes, I can in several different ways. I mean, first of all, the report actually makes fo false historical claims about the importance of slavery in the British economy. So it doesn't stand up to historical scrutiny. It's extremely selective with its data. Uh, it even calls for the church to repent of the spiritual disruption that was involved in, in the church bringing the gospel to Africa. Now, I think all my black African Anglican friends would be rather shocked by that. They're actually rather grateful for it. And in fact, of course, the irony is that the Anglican church around the world is incredibly diverse and it's it's not quite majority black, but it's majority non-white. So the churches that are growing are in Africa and in Asia. And of course, the reason for that is because folk went from England and they, they shared the gospel. And the report seems to think that that was a really bad idea. Um, and it's it, it says actually the report's not asking for reparations. It is asking for a particular form of investment. But that figure, that headline figure of £1 billion appears to me, as from looking at the report, I can't see any evidence for it, seems to have been just plucked out of the air. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be helpful. I think it's going to be very divisive, and I don't think it's going to ad address any problems. It's not based on evidence. And, of course, critics would say this is because of a large fund that the church had. I think it was, was it Queen Elizabeth I bequeathed to the church, was invested in the slave trade. That's what they'll say, and therefore that's why they say we need to make these repayments. Well, if that's the argument, then let's look at the facts. Let's look at uh, what what proportion of the British economy was based on this. Let's look at how involved the church was. The other thing I think is really sad is that the report fails to do two other things. It fails to take seriously uh, church opposition to the slave trade and, and the role the role that Britain played in in um, stamping out um, the slave trade. But it also fails to draw on you know central Christian theological resources. I mean, if you read the New Testament, the one thing that the writers impress on us again and again and again is that the Christian faith was incredibly diverse. The early church was, was diverse ethnically, culturally, racially, linguistically, but it was actually a good news about Jesus that drew them together. And that's actually the, the primary resource we've got. And it's a real tragedy that the report doesn't actually draw on that and in, in many ways seems to push against it. It seems to want to import the sort of cultural language from America of critical race theory and impose that on the UK situation in the church. And, and that's not going to be the way forward. OK, thank you very much for joining us, Dr Ian Paul, on that You're controversial welcome. plan to pay £1 billion in reparations for slavery from the Church of England. It's out there, isn't it? And it makes you wonder, is the Church of England actually now pandering to its flock or is it being taken over by a different mindset? This is the plea for rich, elder Christians to bequeath their will to the Church to pay into this pot to take care of what it considers to be the stain of slavery. Is that what the Church should be doing? Is that what you think the church should be doing? Well, as the government tries and fails to tackle the migrant crisis, Swella Braverman has told us that firms that rely on foreign workers should pay more in tax to help bring down net migration. She gave an exclusive interview to Christopher Hope. She also talks about policing, about tax cuts for British people, about Lee Anderson and about leaving the East HR. We'll have that after this. I'm Martin. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Afternoon, welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. A few heavy showers around this afternoon, but they're going to fade through this evening. Most of us having a dry night, some fog and frost in the southwest. That's where we've had the clearest skies through the day. Still some heavy showers across the southeast. They'll tend to drift away. A few scattered showers across parts of Scotland, but for most it's a dry night. We'll keep quite a lot of cloud in the east. That will help to keep the temperatures up here 
But further west with the clearer skies, temperatures are going to dip down close to freezing, a frost likely in rural parts of Wales and southwest England. Along with some freezing fog patches, they could linger through the morning at Russia, parts of the M4 and the M5 in particular, so bear that in mind. But they should clear away and then much of the west will have a fine day on Wednesday. Main exception to that being Cornwall, where there will be more cloud and a few showers. In the east, again, quite a lot of cloud, and we'll see a few showers over parts of eastern England, a bit of rain over the uh, Grampians as well. A chilly day on some of those eastern coasts, 6, 7 degrees, but further west, a bit of sunshine, double digits, maybe 12 Celsius. Thursday will be a similar day in that western areas will see the, the lion's share of the dry and bright weather. Always more clouds in the east. A few more heavy showers likely on Thursday, though, particularly over parts of the Midlands and Wales. One or two lively downpours possible. Again, where it's gloomy and glum, temperatures in single digits, where we see a bit of brightness, temperatures should climb to double figures, maybe up into the teens in one or two places. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won, plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 45 pounds in tax-free cash text gb win to 84902 text cost two pounds plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to gb03 po box 8690 derby de1 nine double t uk only entrance must be 18 or over lines close at 5 p.m on friday the 29th of march full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand good luck I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon to you. It's 5 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Dorbley Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. What a cracking hour coming up. And there's an exclusive interview with Sue Ella Braverman, and she's told us that firms that rely on foreign workers should pay more in tax to help bring down net migration. That'll get them going. And with another huge pro-Palestine protest expected in London this weekend, I'll get a reaction to the news that a Palestinian woman who hijacked two planes is giving a talk in the UK on Friday. 
And as the RNLI celebrates its 200th anniversary, some are asking if it's fit for purpose, with the check with the lifeboat charity increasingly being used to assist border control to rescue channel migrants. Is it a taxi service in disguise? That's all coming up in your next hour. Welcome to the show, you wonderful people. Always a pleasure to have your company. Get in touch all the usual ways, gbviews at gbnews.com. That's Suella Bravman interview really is a red meat buffet. Lower taxes for British people, higher taxes for firms that, f that hire foreign workers. Leave the ECHR defending Lee Anderson and doubling down on the rhetoric that parts of London are now no-go areas. You will not want to mess it. And the big question is... Is Suella Bravman the future leader of the Conservative Party that you would like to see? Yes or no? Get in touch. GBviews at gbnews.com. But first, it's time for your all-important latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom tonight is that the Chancellor looks set to unveil a two pence in the pound cut to national insurance contributions as he prepares to set out Britain's budget tomorrow. Jeremy Hunt will attempt to put the UK's economy back on track and revive Rishi Sunak's popularity, despite the fiscal watchdog giving the government little headroom for tax cuts. Analysts are suggesting the NHS could be facing real-term funding cuts of £2 billion annually amid rising costs and a promise to tackle waiting lists. And in other news today, Suella Bravman has told GP News she doesn't believe former Tory MP Lee Anderson is Islamophobic. Today's exclusive interview with the former Home Secretary comes after Mr Anderson claimed Islamists had got control of the London Mayor. Lee Anderson is a, a great colleague of mine. I I'm totally abhor the accusations that have been launched against him. He is not racist, he is not Islamophobic. He's calling out very poor performance by the Mayor of London, who has completely failed to hold the Met Commissioner to account, and which is why we've seen emboldened Islamism in the streets of London. We've seen an MP hounded out of office because of Islamism. We've seen Parliament uh, totally subverted and the proper procedures abused uh, out of fear. Suella Braverman. Now, the policing of a pro-Palestinian protest in London this weekend will nevertheless remain unchanged despite the Prime Minister's call for a crackdown on extremists. Officers will reportedly use existing public order and anti-terror laws. That's after Rishi Sunak called on police to draw a line and clamp down on extremist behaviour. Tributes have been paid to a bright and fun-loving girl who was found dead in the West Midlands. The body of 10-year-old Shay Kang was discovered with injuries at an address near Birmingham yesterday afternoon. A 32-year-old woman understood to be known to her has been arrested and taken into custody. Now, an agreement on a revised offer for hospital consultants in England has been reached in a potential step towards solving the ongoing dispute. Unions will now recommend the offer to their members ahead of an expected vote. The Health Secretary is saying it paves the way for an end to the strikes, while the Prime Minister says it's proof that seeking a fair agreement is the best way forward for everyone. A separate dispute involving junior doctors, however, is still ongoing. A 42-year-old man has admitted to starting a fire at the constituency office belonging to Conservative MP Mike Freer on Christmas Eve. Paul Harwood denies the attack was politically motivated, but he did plead guilty to two charges of arson at the Old Bailey earlier today. A second person, 32-year-old defendant Zara Kayseri, denied the charges. Both defendants were remanded in custody with a further hearing set for the 12th of March. And that follows the Justice Minister's announcement he's quitting politics after being the target of several death threats. A Tesla factory in Germany... Sorry, this is a completely different story. A Tesla factory in Germany has been forced to halt production after an alleged arson attack by far-left activists. 
The gigafactory near Berlin was left without power after a nearby electricity pylon caught fire. A letter was later published by local media purporting to be from activists calling themselves the Volcano Group. They said the attack was aimed at Tesla's CEO, Elon Musk. The factory's also been the target of recent environmental protests and police in Germany are, we're told, continuing their investigation. Now, if you've been having any trouble accessing Facebook or even Instagram this afternoon, you're not the only one. The company says it's been hit by outages all over the world, with hundreds of thousands of people locked out of their Meta accounts across both platforms. A spokesperson for Meta says the company is working hard to fix the issues and services in some territories has been restored. Now, here's something to get your teeth into. Thousands of staff at Greggs are to get a slice of more than £17 million in bonuses. That's after the High Street Bakery's profits rose by 27% in the last year. Staff can expect to see the extra dough, if we can say that, in their pay packets at the end of this month to recognise their hard work. And it's the icing on the cake for workers. No apologies there for that either, who already get a share of the profits each year. No puns in this piece, none needed. If you were a fan of soap operas in the 90s, you'll probably remember this. It became the world's most watched TV series during the original run and now those red bathing suits and slow motion jogs along the Californian beaches are set to return. A new series of Baywatch has been commissioned by US network Fox. It's going to see a whole new generation of lifeguards embarking on daring ocean rescues. The original series ran for a decade from 89 to 99 and made superstars of its cast including David Hasselhoff and Pammy Anderson. It's expected to premiere this autumn. For the very latest stories, do sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Polly. Now, our top story this hour, of course, is that exclusive interview with Suella Braverman and the former Home Secretary hasn't held back on a huge range of issues. On the migrant crisis, she's called for new laws which would sidestep the European Court of Human Rights. Well, joining me now in our studio is our political editor, Christopher Hope, and the former Labour aide and political commentator, Stella. How do you pronounce your surname? Tan de Kivu. Thank you, you for asking me. <laughs> it's better that you say it yeah. than I get it wrong. Let's start with you, Chris. Chris, great interview. It's really got the airwaves going. A blatant play for the Tory leadership, surely? No. Well, you say that. I mean, I didn't ask that question. I don't I didn't think so. The idea was to her talk about taxation on either the budget. We know a lot of what she thinks about home affairs and about immigration and the borders, but what she thinks about tax, she came up with a, a plan to cut 2p off income tax to try and raise money by charging companies which hire um, more foreign workers at the expense of British workers, um, other, uh, to withdraw some funding for the railways, a carbon capture process. But what's quite interesting I think in this week we are sitting on Tuesday between these two big days in the House of Lords where they're debating the Rwanda plan. Mm. Five amendments lot, lot, lost last night by the government and more probably lost tomorrow. But here's her idea about how to stop the boats. A lot uh, about the boats uh, in, in recent years. Uh, you know, the, mm. the priority is that we need to pass a law that actually stops the boats. Uh, I made my views clear that I don't think the law currently going through Parliament will do the job. I don't think it's going to be a sufficient deterrent. Um, but the, the solution, the solution is actually uh, ultimately to pass a law that excludes uh, people from making individual claims, excludes the totality of international law, the European Convention of Human Rights, the Refugee Convention, which stymie our ability to control our borders, pass it via emergency measures, i.e. more quickly than is currently being done, so we get it on the statute books and we can actually operationalise flights to Rwanda on a, on, a, on a large scale with large numbers of passengers and on a regular basis, because that's the only way we, get, we send the message that coming to the UK on a small boat will not lead to a life in this country. Stella, I'm going to come to you now. They talk about stopping the boats. Yesterday, we had record numbers. The only boat that really managed to stop is the Bibby Stockholm. Mm -hmm. They were defeated in the Lords again last night. It's a topic they talk a lot about, but they don't seem to deliver much on. No, exactly, and I find it very interesting because in this interview that she did, which 
I thought it was very tame for Suella Braverman's standards, and I think what's going on there is that she's trying to, uh, to, to, to place herself as a future leadership hopeful. So she is trying to show that this, the Rwanda plan is still a big issue for her, but she hasn't really criticized Jeremy Hunt on the fact that his tax cuts tomorrow are going to be completely unfunded. And I think that it is very fitting with the position she's taking on the Rwanda plan, because the Rwanda plan, for the majority of people who look at it objectively, they would also say, this also sounds like a big waste of money. You are spending over half a billion pounds on something that so far has not has not had any results and something that's only going to impact less than 1% of asylum seekers surely the public will think there are better things to spend our money on Last week, or a couple of weeks ago, the government said they will be spending something like £8 million for children's mental health, right? Mm. So, surely for the majority of the public, we have more important issues, like children's mental health, like the NHS. We know, of course we know, the public cares about immigration. It's the third most important issue on the agenda. The first one is economy, the economy, but the second is the NHS. Surely our money would be better spent there. A lot of people think it's money well spent to stop the boat, sir, but Chris, she was also talking, again, another red meat topic, and that is about increasing taxes on companies that employ a lot of foreign workers. Yes, yeah, she's dealing with the issue of net migration. 745,000 arrived here in the last calendar year. Uh, to in 2022, and she was saying, well, why is that happening? What, what measures can be taken? The government has got, got its own ideas, uh, stopping family members coming over here with those on visas, cutting it by 300,000 by next year, but her idea is different. She wants to tax uh, companies which hire more foreign workers. It's an unusual idea, a new idea. Here's what she had to say. Interested in something I did as Home Secretary in raising taxes and charges on businesses that employ foreign workers. So we have already an immigration health surcharge and an immigration skills charge. I think we need to increase those charges. That would not only raise revenue, estimated to be up to £8 billion, but it will also have a benefit, a corollary benefit, I think, of lowering net migration. We know the British people have voted time and time again to lower overall numbers, and we have unprecedented numbers of foreign workers coming in. So, Stella, um, the idea to increase taxes on the companies, to decrease legal migration, or they could just not give as many visas out. The thing is, right, a lot of these policies, they, they, they make it sound as if it's just the companies that will be paying out, but already she's, 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 made it very, she's made it a lot more expensive to be an immigrant in the UK. She wants to make it even more expensive. And people look at this and they're thinking, great, we're going to reduce immigration. But the people you have here already, a lot of them, they are the teachers that are going to be teaching at your schools, who you need, you, and, you, and you don't have enough of those. Mm -hmm. They are the nurses and the social care workers that you need for your NHS. They are the construction workers who you need to tackle your housing crisis. Crisis. So that is all well and good what she's saying about making it so expensive for immigration. But who do you think is going to pick up the tab in the end? Well, she's going she's to be trying to tackle the idea that the that companies rely on foreign labour as a way to avoid hiring more expensive UK labour. And, and there is surely something there, right? There is sur surely something there where I think sometimes politicians, the government, this conservative government that has for years been promising the, the voter that we're going to reduce immigration and this is what we want to do, have been going into backroom chats with businesses and companies and saying, oh, OK, what about you guys? You need more foreign workers. Don't you worry. We got it for you. Rather than being honest from the, to, for, from, from the get-go, which is to say that, look, we, we, there are some jobs that we haven't managed to convince British people to take up those jobs. Very often it is because these jobs don't really pay very well and we have made them less... We have limited the quality of these mm. jobs. So this could be the, 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 the honest thing to do as a politician, to go out and say, this is... This is the root of the cause, rather than this is just a plaster, I'm going to stick it mm. on it and I'm going to say whatever I want. OK, great. Chris, um, you sat down with her. Mm. I always ask you, you get up close and personal, you can look them in the eyes, you can get a feel. Does Suella Braverman feel like she still has something to give? Does she feel like she's waiting for her time to come back? I think so. I think it's no question. I mean, I think lots of people like Suella Braverman, she would never admit this publicly, or even privately, probably, but I think they, people are, are getting ready for what will happen after the election. I mean, it's expected Labour win the election and and then form a next government. What will happen to the Tory party? Who's left, and who who can who can almost take the kind of the right wing uh, st the torch, and who can and be the person who can speak for the right? <clears throat> the big issue, I think, with Sarah Braveman is there's no one like her in cabinet. She was in there. She was put in that post because she brought support for Rishi Sunak. She, she she was sat by the PM. No one replaced mm -hmm. her of the same ilk. So the right 
a wing of the party look at that and think, mm. well, who's there for me? And that's why she's on the channel here giving out her view. Mm. Stella, final word to you. Um, from a Labour Party point of view, would a Conservative Party that goes further to the right be something that you would see as a threat or something you would actually quite relish? Mm. Oh, no, I think the Labour Party would welcome that. <laughs> <laughs> they would welcome that because it, it does mean that the, then everyone looks a lot more moderate and it makes it a lot easier because I think what, what the Conservative Party is doing right now, especially Rishi Sunak, less so Shuala Breverman, who I think is being a lot a lot more truer about what she actually believes. What Rishi is doing, he's alienating everyone. He's alienating the original voters who would like someone like Rishi Sunak, but he's also not convincing the voters who would prefer someone like Jamie Bellino or Suella Breverman mm -hmm. to be leader mm -hmm. and who will eventually be going to the Reform Party, of course. Superb. St Stella, Stan, thank you. Do hope I did that justice. Good you, enough. You were excellent. Please come back. Chris Hope, excellent interview mm -hmm. as ever. Loads to talk about. Great stuff. Thanks to both of you. Now you can watch the full interview with Suella Breverman, of course, on our YouTube channel and there's lots of analysis on our website and thanks to you gbnews.com is the fastest growing national news website in the country so thank you very much next a Palestinian woman who gained notoriety in the late 1960s and early 70s for hijacking two planes is set to give a talk in the UK on Friday Leila Khaled who also calls Hamas militants freedom fighters will appear via video link at a fundraiser hosted by the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, who've, of course, been organising all of those marches. But her appearance has sparked concern amongst Jewish campaign groups and has been raised with members of Parliament. Well, I'm joined now by political commentator, commentator Joseph David. Welcome to the show, Joseph. How does it make you feel when you see somebody who effectively was a terrorist being fated and interviewed in the UK decades on during this very sensitive political time? I think it's abhorrent. Um, this is an unrepentant uh, terrorist or former terrorist who's being used for a fundraiser. People are going to give money um, based on her actions and, and, and her words. Um, could they not find um, a more appropriate person to speak for, for, for their movement? Now, of course, um, she's not actually going to appear in the country. It's via video link. So what about those who will say, well, this is freedom of speech? I'm all for freedom of speech, but what we are witnessing is the normalization of extremism. Um, there are very, very many people who want to advocate for Palestinian rights, and, and they are not unrepentant terrorists. They're not people who describe Hamas baby butcherers as freedom fighters. There are plenty of decent people who they could choose, um, and they've chosen someone who's got an extremist past uh, and hasn't in any way rode back from her previous actions. So freedom of speech is one thing. Thing, but we need to bear in mind the impact that it's going to have on, on, on the, the Jewish community, the wider community in the United Kingdom, and there should be a level of responsibility um, placed on the organisers. And, Joseph, that leads me neatly onto my next question. In an interview with GB News today, Suella Braverman has said that parts of London have become no-go areas for Jewish people. What would you say to that? Um, <sighs> I would say that in, in, in times where there are heightened tensions, definitely Jews do need to be careful. Um, I myself find that I can go all throughout London and thank God um, things are generally um, quite calm and, and accepting. Having said this, Rishi Sunak made a speech Friday evening where he said that we were going to be clamping down on extremism. We need action, not just words. The, the fact that just prior to his speech, there was a projection on the Elizabeth Tower of what is widely considered to be a hate message by the same group, the Palestine uh, um, Solidarity Movement. Um, and then just after his speech, we have this um, unrepentant uh, former terrorist going to give an online talk. Uh, so we need to ask ourselves, what are we actually doing to tackle um, e extremism? And it won't be too long that areas of London will be no-go zones if we don't do something about this. OK, thank you for joining us, political commentator Joseph David. And it's worth pointing out that you talk about let's have action. I was out there on Wednesday when those images were being projected. I was repeatedly saying to police officers, there's a projector, go and take it down. What are you going to do? That's an offence. They simply shrugged and did nothing. And when they keep saying we need action, well, when's it going to happen? When will that action happen? They have the bill 
Do they have the will? That's the big point. And as for getting former terrorists to speak in Britain, even via video link, does that send out the message that's, 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 that runs alongside the message from the government? That anybody who undermines the values of Britain will be classified as an extremist? Surely this does that. Let me know your thoughts. GBviews at gbnews.com. Now it's time for the new latest Great British Giveaway and your chance to win £12,345, one, two, three, four, five in cash and a whole host of seasonal treats. And here's how that Wonga could be yours. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won, plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Great stuff gets stuck in. Now, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt will deliver his spring budget tomorrow. But what can we expect? Well, GB News' economics and business editor Liam Halligan will give his expert view with On The Money. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight. Every night from 11pm. Is a debate on gender really a far-right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase, you know what I mean? Like, anyone who talks about... Anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right, because that's what, that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her. Her, uh, touching her zip because they said that her touching her zip was a far right uh, dog whistle because she's she's making that symbol. Yeah, but when she, she wasn't making the symbol; wow. she was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And oh, no, also, this isn't a far right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly. Yeah. I mean, well, this she is she just the just office, we, She's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so so not far right. But also, I mean, even if she were right wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an, one of the most important issues of our day? What well, are Labour playing at here? They're anti democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack a mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say, I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if no, you they say won't. that, will they? Because you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <coughs> I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free.
Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 5.25. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, could squeeze public spending further in a bid to, cut fun to fund any tax cuts in tomorrow's spring budget. But public service workers say prioritising pol politically driven tax cuts over improving public services is simply wrong. Well, joining me now is GB News' economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Liam, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. So, it's Budget Eve, which for a man like you is like Christmas Eve. What can we expect? <laughs> yeah, better get home and get an early night, Martin. It'll be busy, <laughs> busy, busy tomorrow. Look, there are going to be tax cuts tomorrow, but not as we know it, uh, because we're probably going to see a cut in national insurance, the headline rate of national insurance. Um, we saw a cut in national insurance from 12%. Uh, to 10%, 12p to 10p in the pound back in January, and we're probably going to see another cut tomorrow from 10p to 8p in the pound. Those two cuts combined will probably make the average worker around 900 quid a year better off, which isn't to be sniffed at. Uh, it's cheaper to cut national insurance, cheaper for the Chancellor, cheaper for the Exchequer to cut national insurance than to cut income tax. Why is that? Because income tax is paid by pensioners on their pensions and income tax is also paid on by landlords on rents that they receive so if you cut national insurance it costs less it's workers and workers alone that get that cut also an, an NIC cut applies in Scotland whereas an income tax cut would only apply in England Wales and Northern Ireland because the Scottish government itself um, controls roughly controls income tax north of the border. And what else are we going to see? Uh, we could also see, I think, um, uh, changes to the non-domicile residence uh, regime of tax uh, that allows wealthy foreigners to benefit from being in the UK, not paying tax on their foreign income. I think we're going to see a freeze in fuel duty. Uh, that's around 52 P on petrol and diesel per litre. That's been frozen for a long time, since 2011. That's not going to change this close to an election. Also, there'll be other measures to try and raise money from the rich, as well as changing that non-domicile tax regime, maybe higher duty uh, on business class airfares. The big picture here, Martin, is that the Chancellor hasn't really got that much room for manoeuvre. There's not that much headroom, as we say, fiscal room in the budget to spend on tax cuts. In my view, personal view, tax cuts actually raise revenue because they increase growth and they increase enterprise and lead to more revenue overall. But it can take time for that revenue effect to come through from lower taxes. And in the meantime, the government would have to borrow. And there isn't much room for Jeremy Hunt to borrow because the government's already mired in debt. But taxes are at a 70-year high. Taxes as a share of the overall economy. A lot of Tory MPs are angry that taxes aren't being cut. A lot of centre-right and centrist voters are angry that taxes is, are so high. There's a lot of pressure on Jeremy Hunt to do something to cut taxes, to try and increase the Tories' electoral chances. Challenging Labour, who, of course, got a 20 points plus lead in opinion polls, but he hasn't got that much ability to do so. That's why he's cutting national insurance rather than income tax, because it's cheaper, as I said. Tomorrow's going there's going to be a lot of fiscal smoke and mirrors, because even though there will be a headline tax cut, that national insurance increase, and if there isn't that happening now, I'm going to look pretty stupid, but I think it will happen. But even though that is likely to happen, I still think the overall tax burden could go up. That's because those thresholds, those tax thresholds have been frozen where you start paying income tax at 12 and a half grand, where you start paying uh, the t the, uh, a high rate of income tax at 50 grand, where you start paying uh, the top rate of tax, 125 grand. They've been frozen for a long time, so more and more people are being dragged into those 
tax brackets. And that's why tax overall is going up, even though headline rates have stayed where they are and even come down in some senses. Fiscal policy is complicated, budgets are complicated, but we're all interested because we all have to live and we all have to use money in some form. So we'll be here tomorrow, won't we? Doing our very best to explain here on the telly, on the radio, to GB News viewers and listeners. OK, well, make sure you get a good night's sleep and make sure you keep believing and make sure you have your Weetabix. Liam Halligan, always a pleasure and never a chore. Superb stuff. Now, there's lots more still to come. Between now and six o'clock, I'll have a cracking debate on the RNLI and whether some of its vessels on the south coast are now little more than migrant taxi services. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. The top stories this hour. We can tell you the Chancellor has looked set to unveil a two pence in the pound cut to national insurance contributions as he prepares to set out Britain's budget tomorrow. Jeremy Hunt will attempt to put the UK's economy back on track and revive Rishi Sunak's popularity despite the fiscal watchdog giving the government little headroom for tax cuts. Analysts suggest the NHS could be facing real-term funding cuts of £2 billion amid rising costs and a promise to tackle waiting lists. Well, the leader of the Labour-led Birmingham City Council has unreservedly apologised to the city's residents for the budget set out today. The cost-cutting plan includes slashing more than £200 million from services across Britain's second biggest city after it effectively declared bankruptcy last year. The cuts come amid what the councillor John Cotton described as a raging crisis in local government caused by the Conservatives, calling them cheerleaders for austerity. We're expected to hear the outcome of the Council's vote on its budget plans later. And let's bring you the very latest from the United States on Donald Trump, where he's expected to dominate today's so-called Super Tuesday, further strengthening his grip on the Republican Party nomination. Fifteen states and one territory are holding simultaneous votes today. Mr Trump's only remaining challenger, Nikki Haley, you can see if you're watching on television, uh, that's her right now, is struggling, though, to secure enough wins to stay in the race. However, the former president's various legal troubles may cause some... Some complications. He's currently facing 91 criminal charges across four United States. And if you've had trouble today with Facebook or even Instagram, don't worry, you're not on your own there. I can tell you there has been a problem with the com with the uh, uh, with Meta. The company says it's uh, had reports users all over the world have been locked out of their accounts or on Facebook it's been saying locked out of account. Meta has said they're working to fix that issue and services in some territories are gradually being replaced. Those are your latest news headlines. Take a look at this QR code on your screen right now and download that if you'd like some alerts. If you can't and you're listening on radio, do go to gpnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Shall we take a look at today's markets for you? Well, the pound will buy $1.2711 and €1.1704. Euros. The price of gold is £1,677.38 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed for the day today at 7,646 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Polly. Now, the German Air Force has accidentally leaked details of British troops on the ground in Ukraine. Well, what does that mean for Britain and the war in Ukraine? I'll have that after this. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Mail on Sunday and the University of Buckingham is calling out wokery at the University of Cambridge. So I guess the culture wars must be almost over then, Josh. Almost, yeah. Cambridge University discriminating against rich, white, privileged, privately educated men uh, claims... The worst which is, you know, Basically me. Uh, <laughs> claims vice-chancellor of rival institution, which is launching a degree course on the 
rise of woke culture. Now, I 100% agree with this. I applied to get into Cambridge, and yeah. I didn't get in yeah. because I was too thick. <laughs> oh, wow, so it wasn't the DEI mafia? No, unfortunately, it was pre-DEI. <laughs> so, so it's like a double insult now. Were uh, you one of those guys who was like had a B, who was like a B average, you know? You look like you should be an A, because you act like an A. I act like an A. You act I've like got an glasses. A. Yeah. I, think, I don't even have to... They don't even have lenses in Lewis, them. do you yeah. think that this is... A little bit cynical, because I, I looked up this uh, University of Buckingham, and they opened in 1973, and their tagline on the internet is, the home of the two-year degree. <laughs> They're trying to break down Cambridge University with this. Well, why not pick the biggest? I mean, that's <laughs> why we should... Why should I, we should be attacking the BBC 24-7 on this thing. I thought we were. Uh, we aren't. We How don't mention it enough. What I, found, <laughs> what I found shocking about this story is Buckingham is the oldest... country's oldest private university and was founded in 1976. <laughs> Something is wrong there. What, was, what, what do you think? Was, was Oxford founded by the government? I don't think it was. Was Cambridge? No, absolutely not. I looked up no. Cambridge was 1209. Yes, so, exactly. So, yeah, so you can it get... wasn't a government But this branch. is actually quite scary. They can do a course on the origins of the woke movement. I'm just saying, someone's going to have a degree yeah. and our job is going to be under threat. <laughs> They're going to know yeah. much more than us. Never. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my new show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm, where real people get to meet those in power and hold them to account. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country in the real world. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Brand new Sundays from 6pm. The Neil Oliver Show. It's absolutely vital that people are given the opportunity to take part in the debate, to say the things that matter to them, uh, to be challenged. A country is only really a shared dream. As long as enough people have a shared idea of what it is, then that country exists. What GB News does is give voices somewhere they can be heard. The Neil Oliver Show. Sundays from 6pm on GB News. Well, there's less than 24 hours now to go until the budget. We'll be doing two special shows live from Whitehaven tomorrow to find out what you, the great pub British public, thinks. The only people, after all, who matter. And you can be part of the audience for either Jubes & Co or the Nigel Farage show. And to get your tickets, go to gbnews.com. And I'm now joined live in London by one of those magnificent pairings. It's Michelle Jubry. I feel like I should show. mimic Jews. that really forceful uh, arms cross position that I've got going on in that purse today. I can't wait for tomorrow, actually. I've got to say, Martin, I always love getting out and about and talking to our audience. So if anyone is coming down there, I want to know what do you want to hear? What do you want to see in that budget uh, tomorrow? I, I wonder, uh, Martin, whether or not people feel optimistic at the moment. Do they sit there and think, do you know what, everything's going to get better off the back of this budget tomorrow? Or do they just think, you know what, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference? So that'll be interesting and I'll be looking at that tonight. Also, I'll be carry on your conversation that you've been having about the protests uh, and the whether or not the police shall act differently uh, this weekend or not. And that whole mess that is Birmingham City Council, what an absolute shambles and what an absolute insult, Martin, that it's normal everyday people that are having to pick up the slack yet again, I mean, times are really hard, having to bail out the inadequacies and the failures of so many councillors. It's absolutely shocking when you look at how many services are going to be cut and how much they 
want to increase the council tax buy. And I'm starting to wonder, is this something that we're going to start to see rolling out across lots of other councils? And also, as well, I've got Lord Moylan on my programme tonight. So I want to ask him, Martin, about those votes in the Lords yesterday and also the ones coming up tomorrow in relation to Rwanda. Also, as well, um, before I forget, 300% increase in council tax for empty properties. Do you think that's a good idea, Martin, or not? It's all about trying to get people not to hold their properties empty. No, it's about robbing people blind. Michelle Jubri, a juicy menu as ever. Six or seven, that's Jubes and Co. Now to the shock news that the German Air Force has accidentally leaked details of British troops on the ground in Ukraine. The mistake has put the Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, under major pressure. And the country's former intelligence chief has warned that the leaks could just be the tip of the iceberg. August Hanning said more NATO secrets may have been compromised after Russia intercepted and published a video call disclosing military information. Well, joining me now to discuss this is the former British Army commander, Colonel Richard Kemp. Colonel Kemp, sounds like abject and utter incompetence. How on earth can this be allowed to happen in this day and age? Well, it, it is extraordinary. It happens only too frequently, not necessarily on this level of seriousness, but it happens a lot. And I think the Germans, I, I, I worked for a while in British intelligence um, while I was in the army, and... Uh, the Germans were regarded often as being notoriously unreliable in terms of operational security. Um, but it happens, unfortunately, it happens too frequently. And we've, we've had so many revelations from this. And it doesn't just kind of show um, military secrets. It also shows, I think it, it, it exposes the abject uh, crave and fear of Russia by Germany when they're talking about um, wanting to they're talking about British troops on the ground helping with Storm Shadow. They're talking about trying to get the British to fulfil a similar function on the ground if they ever get around to supplying German Taurus missiles, rather than risk having Germans anywhere near it so that the Russians might uh, take offence at them. It's, it's, it's really a, a, a really revealing and very, you know, very concerning scenario. And Colonel Kemp, we had you on the show yesterday. We had to rudely cut you off because we cut to Donald Trump, who was giving a live press conference. I'd like to ask you, though, about yesterday's topic. Kamala Harris wading in and saying that the US should back an immediate ceasefire, taking the position of the Red Cross, the UN, South Africa. Why are international allies abandoning Israel? I, I was very, very disappointed that you considered President Trump more important. <laughs> For me, but I'll, we'll pass over that. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, the, 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 the reality here in the US and to an extent in the UK, maybe less so in the UK, is that politicians like Kamala Harris, like uh, Donald, not, not Donald Trump, but like uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, and um, the, the US Secretary of State and politicians like our own Prime Minister uh, and David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, they're talking out of both sides of their mouth, really. They're, 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 they are. Both countries actually are pretty strong in their support for Israel. They understand what Israel is trying to do, and they know what they're trying to do. But at the same time, they've got to appease their anti-Israel elements for their electorate, particularly in the US, I think, but also to an extent in the UK. And calls, calls on Israel to cease fire, to stop attacking Hamas. In other words, to surrender to Hamas, to leave Hamas intact are totally misplaced. They're dangerous because um, the, you know, the, 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 what, what they should be asking for, all of these politicians, they should be demanding a surrender from Hamas. Hamas surrender, lays down its weapons, and hands over the hostages. That way, they guarantee that the violence ends. That's the way to do it, not to put pressure on Israel, as if Israel is the aggressor. Israel's, no. I'm in Israel now. Israel is defending its citizens against this horrific genocidal terrorist organization, Hamas, which wants to kill not only the maximum number of Israeli civilians, but they actually want the Israelis to kill as many of their own civilians as possible. You, you, you can't take this approach of, of, uh, of, of suggesting Israel should stop its operations. You should, the approach that should be taken by these politicians is calling on Hamas to surrender. OK, superb as ever. Former British Army Commander Colonel Richard Kemp, thank you for very much for joining us. I'm not interrupted this time by Donald Trump.
Now, the RNLI celebrated its 200th anniversary yesterday, but I'm asking the big question today. Is it still fit for purpose? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Headliners, tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11pm. Welcome back to Headliners. And, Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old-fashioned, traditional mail breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Rao, as hospitals say, hormone-filled milk from trans <laughs> women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue. And they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. Uh, yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Exhibit A. Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because, you know, when ho hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. I don't want to shame this hospital. This is... Whether it's this, necessary. You yeah, let's do. Hospital Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences I have read on, aloud in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do this show. It says, the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. <laughs> yep. Oh, my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yeah. scary thing. And no. when it's not, when we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby. No, but the uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it yeah. rather than it's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So every Sunday from eleven, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. 5.48. We're on the final furlong. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, the RNLI celebrated its 200th anniversary with a service of Thanksgiving at Westminster Abbey yesterday. But some of their volunteers seem to spend more time these days picking up illegal migrants than rescuing people who have got into trouble just off the British coast. Well, viewers who are watching on GB News now can see some exclusive footage of the RNLI dropping off those migrants in the over, adding fuel to the fire. They are actually a taxi service. And this map here shows an RNLI boat picking up migrants miles and miles in the English Channel. You can see it sets off there about half past nine on Tuesday night. Goes to midships there, that purple line representing the English waters, picks up migrants from a French vessel, picks off two miles from the coast and then starts bringing them back towards Dover. Then they hoover back towards Dover and drop them off. Quite clearly, 
acting as a taxi service, as we can see there. So let's have a debate about this. I'm joined in the studio by GB News' senior political commentator, Nigel Nelson, and down the line, Kevin Saunders, who's the former chief immigration officer at UK Border Force. Gentlemen, let's kick this off. So let's start with you, Kevin. So on the 200th anniversary of the RNLI, Kevin, a lot of people are saying its purpose has dramatically shifted. It's gone from rescuing British people in trouble in our waters to becoming little more than a taxi service. Mid-channel, picking up immigrants um, ferried over by French vessels that get into trouble only one or two miles from the French coast. Is that criticism valid? Yes, it's very valid. It's, it's what's happening. But what you've got to look at, Martin, is that uh, with the overall figures uh, of the RNLI, only about 3% of the people they rescue are people in the channel. Now, that 3% is quite significant in the channel because that's what their boats are doing. But the overall figure is there shows that, that it is only a, a very small thing. Now, you've got really two stories here. You've got, first of all, the RNLI going out to rescue people. Um, the second story is the French letting them. And what we really ought to be doing is getting the French to actually stop the boats coming across in the first place. So, Nigel Nelson, do you think that this is what the RNLI should be doing? Have they lost sense of what they stand for? Or is any life at sea in peril a life worth saving? Well, yes, is the, is the answer to that one. That's, uh, that's the RNLI's job, that they're out there to rescue people. Um, over the, the 200 years they've been in existence, they've, they've saved more than uh, 140,000 lives. And if somebody is crossing the channel in a tiny dinghy, which is no bigger than a child's paddling pool, those people are at risk. The RNLI should be doing this. I live in Kent. I'm on the front line of all this, that my family know RNLI volunteers. And they feel this is part of their job. They don't want to be doing it. They'd rather be at home. But this is part of their job, uh, and it is saving lives, and that's what they're there for. But, Kevin, the counter-argument would be that these vessels are leaving France of their own accord. They know the risks. And when they're encountered one or two miles off the French coast by French vessels, they don't want to be taken back to France. Where's the equivalent service in France that should be surely taking those people back to France, not to the middle of the Channel, and then the RNL? I finish it off and bring them to Blighty. Well, yes, you're, you're quite right. You're, you're spot on, Martin. Um, the trouble is the French interpretation of the law of the sea is different to our interpretation. So the French will not get involved generally unless the people in the boat say, we need help. Then they will rescue them. But the, the, what is so ridiculous about all of this is that one metre in French territorial waters, they don't need rescuing. And as your, your film showed, the second they come over the purple line into British territorial waters, all of a sudden they do need rescuing. And that is what is so absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the RNLI do a very, very good job. And, I mean, there are people in border force that are actually also on the lifeboats, uh, particularly in Kent. So, you know, our border force officers are doing, really, doing two things here. Um, but the RNII do a good job, and without them, there would, be, there would be more problems, because border force do not have vessels that are capable of rescuing people in the channel. The six cutters that we've got haven't been in the channel for over a year. OK, uh, let's have the final word to you, Nigel Nelson. Um, surely it's not the responsibility of the RNLI to simply pick up people mid-channel and act as that taxi service. It is the responsibility of the, of the RNLI to pick up people who are, uh, are at risk. And the volunteers who do it, I know one of them who gets uh, abused in the street and spat on for doing it, he feels that is his job, it's his job to save lives, and these lives are at risk. OK, thank you very much, gentlemen. We have to leave it there.
Now then, very quickly, ahead of the budget day tomorrow, Jeremy Hunt has been urged to do more to help homeless people in his constituency in the following tweets. Check this out. I was sent the following email by Paul Grinley in response to it. Hello, Martin. I'd like to bring to your attention this homeless lady I saw today who is living in Farnham Town Centre. That's Jeremy Hunt's constituency. Given Mr Hunt is due to announce his budget tomorrow, it struck me as ironic, quite sickening, that three miles away is a hotel full of illegal immigrant men and five miles away is a block of 100 new flats about to be occupied by illegals as well, all funded by the government using our taxes whilst he leaves it to the people, the good people in town, to keep her fed and watered. I voted Tory all my life, but now that is over. Thanks for that email. I'll be back tomorrow, 3 till 6. After this, Jubes and Co. But first, it's time for your latest weather forecast with Alex Deacon. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Afternoon. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. A few heavy showers around this afternoon, but they're going to fade through this evening. Most of us having a dry night, some fog and frost in the southwest. That's where we've had the clearest skies through the day. Still some heavy showers across the southeast. They'll tend to drift away. A few scattered showers across parts of Scotland, but for most it's a dry night. We'll keep quite a lot of cloud in the east. That will help to keep the temperatures up here. But further west with the clearer skies, temperatures are going to dip down close to freezing, a frost likely in rural parts of Wales and southwest England, along with some freezing fog patches. They could linger through the morning at Russia, parts of the M4 and the M5 in particular, so bear that in mind. But they should clear away, and then much of the west will have a fine day on Wednesday. Main exception to that being Cornwall, where there will be more cloud and a few showers. In the east, again, quite a lot of cloud, and we'll see a few showers over parts of eastern England, a bit of rain over the uh, Grampians as well. A chilly day on some of those eastern coasts, 6, 7 degrees, but further west, a bit of sunshine, double digits, maybe 12 Celsius. Thursday will be a similar day in that western areas will see the, the lion's share of the dry and bright weather. Always more clouds in the east. A few more heavy showers likely on Thursday, though, particularly over parts of the Midlands and Wales. One or two lively downpours possible. Again, where it's gloomy and glum, temperatures in single digits, where we see a bit of brightness, temperatures should climb to double figures, maybe up into the teens in one or two places. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable 